Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen scams customers, gets busted and goes to jail. My daughter, Amber, has been challenging since birth. She's never displayed any signs of empathy or remorse and is completely uncaring about anything other than her own wants. We did everything we could when she was growing up therapy, specialists, and regular contact with experts in her disorder. Amber studied well, but drifted away from us as soon as she got her first job. She kept in touch, but rarely visited. Amber ran a scheme which targeted several elderly, disabled, and vulnerable people and tricked them into giving away money. A few of them ended up passing with nothing left, and Amber got some heavy criminal charges as a result. Amber was found guilty at trial, and ahead of her sentencing next month, the judge denied her bail because she won't be getting anything other than prison time. I visited her yesterday to see how she was coping and to see if she needed anything. Amber excitedly told me that some friends and people who used to work for her had brought her clothes to wear to court. She said she planned to go to her sentencing in red pants and a tailored suit. I was completely shocked. Obviously, she should wear something smart to court. But a tailored suit and designer shoes looks like she's some big businesswoman and it's sending all the wrong messages and doesn't exactly suggest she's humble or remorseful. Amber's argument was that she's looking at a long sentence no matter what and so she might as well go out with style. I was sickened and I made it clear that if she shows up dressed to the nines, she won't be getting any support from me when she's in there or when she comes out. I said she'll never see me again, but she didn't particularly care. My husband sees my point but he says that I know who and what our daughter is. He says we all know she isn't capable of remorse and that it shouldn't be fair to withdraw support because of that. I'm well aware of that, but she at least has to try. How will it look to the people she scammed if she shows up for sentencing in expensive clothes that she purchased by destroying their finances? The least she can do is look humble and look like she knows what she did was wrong. My husband thinks withholding support is too far. I disagree. She's my daughter and I will always love her, but her crime was horrific and if she doesn't regret it, the very least she can do is try to look like she does to give comfort to the people she hurt. If she shows up to court in expensive clothes, she will never see or hear from me again. Am I the jerk? The fact it's her clothes that make you want to cut her off and not her behavior is really odd. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or does she have a point? Please let us know. What she wears when she goes to court is the least of these people's worries. Am I the jerk for wanting my husband to cancel his trip? My husband, who's 27, has been planning a trip for about four years with some close friends. The trip kept being postponed due to some of his friends having family issues, financial issues, and unfortunate world events. My husband is finally going to be able to leave within two months. The issue I, 21 female, have with that is that I'm pregnant and he's leaving near my due date. This is my first baby and I don't want to go through childbirth alone. I don't have family other than my husband. My dad has passed and my mom is mentally ill. I just want his support throughout the process, but he's making me feel really bad for asking him to postpone just his trip so that he can be here for his daughter and I. He told me that it's honestly not that big of a deal. He said when he was at the hospital for his son from a previous relationship that the birth only took an hour and that the nurses were very supportive. I also don't want to care for his son after I come home from the hospital alone. He plans on being away for a month and has sole custody. His son goes to his mom's every other weekend, but that's all. Sometimes his mom won't even show up. He hasn't made any plans on where his son is going to go after I come home from the hospital. His sister agreed to take him while I'm in the hospital, but she can't do any longer than that as she has a full-time job and doesn't want to take too much time off work. He told me I'll be able to handle everything by myself and begged me to drop the issue because he's been planning this for so long and he's really excited to go. He even offered to pay me for all the hardships and told me that women take care of their kids after coming home from the hospital all the time. I do understand that this wasn't exactly planned and I feel awful about the whole situation. A huge part of me wants to just drop the issue and find a way to deal with everything by myself. 
I mean, his friends are calling me a jerk and saying that I'm spoiling everyone's fun. Am I the jerk here? Not the jerk. He offered to pay you for all the hardships? Red flags. I never overreact on these posts, but wow. Due to extremely unfortunate work circumstances out of our control, my husband had to be in China for a month after my daughter was born. We live in the Bay Area. I had a two-year-old at the time, and I also had a C-section. It was beyond incredibly difficult. I couldn't lift my baby. I couldn't drive. I had no help, no family around. It was horrible. Not the jerk. Pack him a nice suitcase and tell him to not come back. Any man who tells his wife that childbirth isn't a big deal and that it doesn't matter if he's there or not is not a man worth having in the delivery room anyways. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Sometimes these stories just break my heart to be honest. Part-timers can't carry phones? Fine, calls won't be answered. I worked at a grocery store for four years. At the time, I was three years into this job. I was working part-time while going to school. I was working in the frozen department, which most people did not want to do. I had a coworker who we'll call Karen. She was full-time and older than me. She was awful, and everyone who knew her in-store couldn't stand her. Our manager and upper managers hated her and never wanted to deal with her. Each department had a minimum of two phones. One was a wired phone on our desks, and the other was a mobile phone with a clip. If our manager was in, he would have it. If not, the first person would grab it and pass it on when they left or took lunch. This was standard procedure until one day, I had held the phone as I was the first one in and had been answering calls as they had come in. Karen enters in an hour after me. She clocks in and comes up to me. OP, I need the phone. She yelled at me with her hand outreached. Okay, do you need to make a call? I asked, wondering what she needed this early. No, I'm supposed to have the phone. She demands, her hand still out. So I give it to her, confused. Okay, here. Why are you supposed to have it? I ask, confused at her statement. I am a full-time and you are not. Full-timers are supposed to be the only ones who have the phones. She replies, rolling her eyes at me. Cue malicious compliance. On the next shift, I come in and my manager is not in. I don't grab the phone. I leave it on the charger at our shared desk. I get to work and start my morning duties. I continue to work and talk with people. An hour and a half later, when Karen finally comes in late, she demands to know where the phone is. I tell her it's on our desk. She stomps off and grabs it. I continue to work for the next couple of hours. At some point, our store manager comes over to me while I'm working in the aisle. Hey, OP, is your manager working today? Hey, no, he's not. It's Karen and I working today. Okay, who has the phone? I keep calling it. He asks, confused, as most of the time calls are answered quickly. Karen has it. Oh, why don't you have it? He asks, fully knowing that when our manager is not here and I am, I have it and can answer and give solutions. Karen told me that you had said only full-time employees are allowed to carry phones. I replied, that's true. You are full-time. I'm not full-time. I'm part-time, I remind him. He asks me to go put ice in one of the freezers. He also asked me where Karen was because she was not in our aisle. I tell him she's supposed to be in the next aisle stocking items there. I walk towards the back to grab some ice. I was not there when the store manager got to her, but she had left the phone on the table she was using to fill items and didn't hear it ringing multiple times. The store manager was upset and told her off for not answering and told her she should not have had the phone if she was just going to leave it laying around. Ten minutes after speaking with the store manager, he came up to me again and I had gotten out of the freezer. He gave me the phone and told me that I should probably keep it on me. Am I the jerk for taking the cake I baked for my fiancé's birthday and going home? Me, female 25, and fiancé, male 31, Ben's mom, don't have the best relationship. I try my best to be polite around her, but she's the type that would have high standards and expectations of whoever dates her son. She has three sons. She's commented on my hair and body several times, and at some point suggested cosmetic surgeries for the future. This upset me, but Ben tells me this is who she is and I need to learn to have thick skin since oftentimes she doesn't really mean to be malicious. Anyways, I'm known for baking cakes and sweets. Ben eats what I make, but whenever I bring something to his family to try, they find every excuse in the world not to eat it. I'm okay with that and stop doing it. For Ben's 31st birthday, his mom wanted to host the party. I decided to bake him his birthday cake and he was thrilled with it. 
I went grocery shopping, took time off work, and put so much effort into making it how he likes it. I took it with me to his mom's house, and to my surprise, when I walked in, I saw a large birthday cake sitting at the dining table. I was puzzled. Future mother-in-law said she requested this cake from the bakery and paid this amount of money for it. I asked, what about the cake I made? She responded, oh, you can place it on the counter over there and we'll let the kids have it. This felt like ice was drooped all over me. I looked at Vin and he nodded at me in a just do it way. I was so mad and the cake was still in my hands at the time. I turned around and made my way to the door. His mom remained standing, but Ben followed me asking where I was going. I told him that he didn't need my cake, and by extension, me, since my efforts were so easily dismissed and disrespected. He said I was overreacting, and that his mom paid so much for that cake, and it was only fair that he accept. He begged me to go back inside and do him this favor by basically just going with the flow, but I decided to go home. He got mad and started saying I was being unreasonable and stirring up drama over nothing. I went home and he didn't get back until 11 p.m. He was so upset, he said he and his family didn't appreciate the childish behavior I displayed and ruining his party and disrespecting his mom like that. Said I turned this into a huge deal and should have acted more mature instead of walking out with the cake. Am I the jerk for taking the cake and walking out? Not the jerk. Please don't marry this man. Run far, far away and bake your cakes for someone who chooses you, not their mom. You deserve it. Not the jerk. The fact that your future husband is telling you to just accept his mom's BS with a smile and then gets mad at you when you don't is very telling. If you marry him, this is just going to grow over time. Info. Did his mom know you were making the birthday cake? Was this discussed at all with her as she was hosting and presumably providing everything? Did you only talk about it with your fiancé? If she knew and agreed to you making it, that was definitely a jerk move on her part. It was at best a total disregard for the effort you put in by relegating it to the kids only, rather than just sharing the table with the cake she bought. At worst, it was a power play to show you how little you matter. If she didn't know, then kind of wasn't a great move on your part to just walk out in a huff. But you have a fiancé who doesn't stick up for you, that tells you to just put up with his mom being rude to you. Is this really how you want to live? with him always putting his mom first? You need to have frank discussions with him about your relationship and about his mother's place in it before you get married and set boundaries as to what is acceptable and what is not acceptable behavior from her. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her future mother-in-law? Please let us know. I've got a solution. Just cut them both in half and give half to me. Problem solved. That's not my name. Background. So I have a semi-common Hispanic first name but living in Midwest United States, people don't always pronounce it correctly. Generally speaking, I think of myself as being fairly flexible with how others pronounce it. If it's our first time meeting, I will say how it's pronounced, and as long as they get somewhat close to the pronunciation after a couple of meetings, I let it slide and acknowledge their efforts. If we've met multiple times and they still clearly make no efforts to pronounce my name correctly, that's when I start taking offense. This wasn't always the case though. Before, I used to just acknowledge whatever people would call me, but after dealing with some identity issues in my teen years, like many of us do, and going to counseling, I learned to fully embrace my identity, including the correct pronunciation of my name, and was taught to stick up for myself as well. This story takes place when I was still making that transition. The Story In my teen years, while attending high school, during freshman and sophomore year, I had a teacher that was a stickler for the rules. One of those that had been teaching for 40 plus years had her system down and wasn't going to let anyone change her way of doing things. On the very first day of class, she handed out her rules and explained them to us. One of these rules included the attendance policy. Every day, right after the bell rang for class to begin, she would go through attendance, read off our name, and when we heard our name, we were to say present, not here, not yes, or anything else. We had to say present. Not sure why she was a stickler for that, but whatever. I had this teacher for two years, and for almost two years, she would pronounce my name incorrectly. What was more confusing is she would pronounce it incorrectly in different ways each time. During attendance, she would get to my name and pronounce it incorrectly. I would then say, present, and my name is pronounced this way. She would then just go on to the next name, making no acknowledgement as to what I had said. This went on for almost two years. I would also like to add that our school was on the smaller side, with classes averaging around 80 to 90 students per grade 
and most teachers would only focus on one or two grades. So the average teacher would probably have to work with 100 to 150 students, and by sophomore year, every other teacher had started pronouncing my name correctly or had already pronounced my name correctly from the beginning. It was during this time that I started developing the aforementioned identity issues and started going to counseling. The counselor pushed me to embrace who I was more and to stick up for myself as well. So that is exactly what I did. Cue malicious compliance. Close to the end of my second year with this teacher, I had had enough and I had also built up enough self-confidence to do something about it. The next day, she went through attendance and just completely butchered my name, so I did not say anything. Teacher looks around the classroom and sees me sitting at my desk, mispronounces my name again. Me, no response. Teacher, louder this time. Have you forgotten the rules of my classroom? You are to respond with present when I call your name. Me, nervously. I still wasn't all that great at sticking up for myself. Your rules say that we are supposed to say present after our name has been called. My name has not been called. Teacher, don't get smart with me, mispronunciation of my name. Me, that's not my name. It's the teacher cuts me off. That's it. I'm not putting up with this. Go to the office. Almost in tears, I head to the office, unsure of what I had done or in what kind of trouble I would be in. But here's the kicker. In between my freshman and sophomore year, we got a new vice principal. This new vice principal was Hispanic as well and was fully aware of the counseling I was taking. I later found out as well that she was very active in the community and was one of the city leaders in pushing for Hispanic rights and advancements. So I walk into the office and she is the first one to greet me. I tell her what had happened and I see her face slowly turn red with anger. She then attempts to regain her control and tells me to go to her office and work on my homework until my next class period, that she will talk to the teacher and to not worry about her. The next day I walk into that class again, unsure of what to expect. The teacher simply begins her class without calling attendance and makes no acknowledgement of me. This continues for a week until we are informed that the teacher and the school board have agreed that she will be taking an early retirement before the end of the school year and that we will finish off the class with a substitute teacher for the remainder of the year. There was a little over a month left in the year, so it ended up just being movies before a very watered down final exam in the last week. Of course, the rumors through the school were that she was forced out and did not receive her full retirement, but I cannot confirm if any of those are true. I never saw her again and went through the rest of my high school career, slowly growing in my confidence. Am I the jerk for exposing my dad to the family after he tried to portray my brother as a bad father and son? My siblings, 24 male, 22 female, and I, 26 male, were raised by a single dad who's 45. Our dad was great. He was loving and caring and always put us first. Because of this, we never missed our deadbeat mom. My dad even sacrificed his love life though. He never dated anyone. My brother, 24 male, disowned our dad around three years ago for a reason I'd also disown him to be honest. My brother found out that his then girlfriend, who's now 27, was cheating on him with our dad. Thus, my brother got mad at my dad and cut him off, moved out of the house and went to live with some friends. No matter how hard my dad has tried to apologize and reach out to him, my brother ignores him. My dad has suffered a lot because of this and has gotten mad at us many times since my sister and I know where my brother lives. We visited him a couple of times and he demands we let him know, but we can't because my brother threatens that if we ever tell him, he'll go no contact with us. The thing is that this woman got pregnant with twins, but she didn't feel like being a mom, so she left them to my dad. My dad tells everyone that he's raising his grandkids. He swears they're my brothers, but I'm sure they are his since my brother says they're not his. The kids turned two a couple of days ago and he hosted a small party, so my uncle started asking about my brother as the kid's father since no one in the family knew what had happened. So my dad started talking crap about my brother, saying that he was an ungrateful son and a terrible father for leaving two kids behind. I think my dad is angry at my brother for not forgiving him as everyone in the family sees my dad as an example for the sacrifices he made, they started talking crap about my brother. I love my dad with my whole heart and I'd do anything for that man. I know all my siblings would. But he tried to portray my brother as a bad guy and I love my brother, so I told him. He wouldn't have disowned you if you hadn't had hooked up with his girlfriend and got her pregnant. Everyone looked at him and he tried to excuse his actions, but everyone told him to buzz off. They've called my brother to apologize, but my dad is angry at me. 
He says this is a family matter and I should have kept my mouth shut. My wife says I did the right thing, but my sister is also on my dad's side. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. He says it's a family matter? Which family? The one whose origin he's lying about? The one he's trying to lie to? Or the one he wants to make complicit in those lies? Regardless, this is 100% about him going out of his way to try and throw your brother under the bus and somehow expecting no one to call him out on it. And he really still wonders why no one wants to help him get back in touch with the guy? Am I the jerk for telling my wife she knew what the deal was when she married me in front of her family? I married my wife Leia three years ago after being in a relationship for three years before that. I have a son, Callum, who's 12. My late wife was Grace. She passed when Callum was 14 months old. I've always made a point of keeping her memory alive. We used to read some of the letters Grace left him for bedtime. I also played the videos she made for him for daily life and looking back on. I also tell him stories about her and about us, as a couple and as a family with him. He has an attachment to her memory and to her through everything she left for him. When I met Leia, he and I talked as I was getting ready to introduce her and he asked if she had to be his new mom. I said no, that it was up to him and their relationship could be anything he was comfortable with. He said he couldn't imagine having someone else be his mom. We talked about it more times as this relationship progressed and I was open with Leia that she was marrying me but she was not becoming a mom. She said she was okay with that but she did want more kids. I agreed to that. We did not expect her to be infertile and unable to have a kid biologically. Ever since that, she has been less okay with not being Callum's mom. She has told me it should be back on the table, despite me telling her Callum's feelings have not changed. So she decided to bring it up in front of her family, saying that she was being his mom but not getting the love or title, that I was making her feel less loved than Grace. Her family started ganging up on me, saying that they had been hearing about it for three years now and how Callum deserved a mom and to be healthy enough to embrace a new mom, and that Leia deserves to be a mom, and to be credited for raising Callum. They said she was doing most of the parenting, which I strongly disagreed with. I'm not some guy who married to pawn his kid off on someone. I actively parent my son and do more than Leia, both because I don't agree with dumping all the parenting on my spouse, it was the same when Grace was alive, because I want to be there for my son, and because Callum comes to me more than Leia. She agreed that she should be doing more as the mother of the household, that I'm being a terrible husband. I asked her what she wanted me to do. To tell Callum that his feelings and clearly established boundaries don't matter and he needs to cater to hers? I've been her shoulder to lean on throughout her finding out she's infertile, throughout any step-parenting struggle she's had. But she really upset me by handling the conversation the way she did and I told her that she knew what the deal was when she married me and I had been clear with her what her role would be and that we were not looking for Callum to have a new mom. Leia was upset. I don't think she was that devastated when she found out she couldn't have kids and her family were upset at me. I do feel bad for snapping like I did, but I'm also mad at her for putting me in the position that she did. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but this is way above Reddit's pay grade. You need a family counselor. Not the jerk. You're right, she knew what the deal was when you married. It's unfortunate that she's infertile, but that doesn't mean she entirely gets to disregard Callum's feelings. That's no way to treat someone who she wants to mother. You're doing great. Would I be the jerk if I tell my boyfriend to not go to Vegas for his birthday? Yeah, it sounds bad from the title I know. My, 31 female, boyfriend, 33, his birthday is on Friday. For over a month now, I've been planning a surprise party for him. I reserved an area at a local brewery, invited all of his friends, all that jazz. His friend Tom is invited, but can't make it because he'll be out of town for work. I talked with Tom specifically about the party when I began planning it. He knows about it. Yesterday, my boyfriend tells me that Tom invited him to Vegas for his birthday weekend because he'll be there for work and has a free room. I was a little upset. Tom knows I'm planning this. I reached out to him and asked if he could reschedule because I'm still doing this party, which again, he knows. He's on the Facebook event chain and a group message about it. He said he had tried to get him to fly out the day after his birthday so the party can still go on. My boyfriend, however, wants to leave Friday because he already took the day off for his birthday. I don't want to ruin the surprise, but I don't want him to go either. I've put a lot of planning into this and it would be pretty bad to have to cancel it at the last minute. I'm so angry at Tom for doing this, knowing full well that I've planned something. My boyfriend knows I'm upset about something, but I think he thinks it's just about him not spending his birthday with me. 
If I hadn't planned this, then I'd say go have fun in Vegas. I don't care. But this is super annoying to me. I want to ask him not to go without somehow blowing the surprise. But I don't want to come off as that girlfriend. And I feel like it would cause a disagreement. My friend said I should just let it go and cancel the party. But that's so frustrating that Tom just selfishly bowls over something nice that I was trying to do. Would I be the jerk for asking him not to go? Update. Thank you all for the advice. As many of you suggested, I talked to my boyfriend. He could tell I was upset about something. I told him, I know you can tell I'm upset, but I want you to know it's 100% not about you. The reason I'm a little irritated about you potentially going to Vegas is because I've been planning something for you that was supposed to be a surprise. I'm feeling annoyed because Tom actually knows about it because I asked him a question about it a few weeks ago. And I also reminded him last night that I was still planning this after you told me of your potential Vegas plans. I want you to have fun on your birthday, so if Vegas is what you really want to do, then I get it. But I'm only upset right now because I'm confused about why Tom even suggested the trip because he knew that I had something going on. He reacted really well and said that it was totally okay and that realistically, he probably wouldn't have gone anyways because it was so last minute. I'm truly bummed that I had to ruin the fact that there was a surprise at all. I had wanted it to be just like a casual beer at a local brewery and then surprise, surprise, all of your friends are here too. But I didn't say what the plan was, just that I'd made one. Still trying to figure out if or how I can tell Tom I think he's a jerk in a mature way. That'll take some thought. Not the jerk, but you might want to inform your boyfriend about what you have planned, and even if it means ruining the surprise, because it seems like Tom is going out of his way to ruin the party for you. Has Tom had any issues with you before now? OP. Yes, often. He's also hit on me before, which I've told my boyfriend and he just laughs it off like, that's Tom being Tom. I think it's gross and weird. He often asks my boyfriend out to drinks and then changes the plans while they're out to have my boyfriend come with him while he meets up with girls from dating apps so my boyfriend can run interference, his words, on her friends, like boundaries do not exist to him. Everything you'd ever need to know is on the front. Staying at an upscale hotel in Denver for work. Had about 30 minutes to spend, so I browsed the gift shop. Saw a junior-sized John Elway jersey. Son is a huge Broncos fan. They're all folded very neatly inside clear bags, the kind that have adhesive in the flap so one could reseal. I ask if I could open one up to check the merchandise. The clerk, Karen, says very sternly, We only carry high-quality, officially licensed, authentic products. Me. Sure. But do you know if Karen cuts me off? Size, jersey number, and player name are printed on the sticker on the front side of the packaging. Me. Sure, but I still would like to know if, again, she cuts me off. You can open the packaging after you have completed your purchase. This time, her eyes got big and her forehead veins were popping out. Okay, I'm happy to comply. I took junior mediums of an Elway, Manning, Terrell Davis, Champ Bailey, and Russell Wilson. Pay for it at the register, open everything up, check the insides, shake my head, and say to Karen, I'm sorry, I'd like to return all these. Karen, what's wrong with them? Me, nothing, they look perfectly fine, but not what I'm looking for. You read the stickers on the front of the packaging, right? Sure I did, but it doesn't say whether or not the numbers and letters are stitched or stuck via ironed-on adhesive. These are all iron-ons, I'm looking for stitched. You could have asked me, I attempted to twice, but you cut me off both times. Her forehead veins were popping off again as she was processing the refund. Well, if I'm not there at 9, why don't you break in and start without me? A few years ago in rural Australia, there was a small empty government office building and Gary, a government department manager. The building had been vacant for about 8 months while committee after committee tried to decide what they were going to do with it. Gary was the manager of the infrastructure department, which was responsible for the upkeep and any modifications to the building. Gary was not an efficient manager. One of his favorite sayings was, Shoot me an email, which was strange because outwardly he didn't seem to ever read them. He also had this knack of never being on time for an appointment. Not many construction industry people I spoke with seemed to take joy in dealing directly with Gary. Where we could, we'd go through everyone else in the department to get stuff done. So Gary became known as Speed Bump, something to be avoided if you could. Now, because I'm an electrical contractor who wears a few different hats, has been to a number of different rodeos over the years, and is afflicted with the curse of competency, I got roped into assisting Speed Bump with this building's future use. 
He asked for a 9 a.m. meeting at his office one day to discuss the building. Arriving at the outer reception 10 minutes early, I asked Jen, the receptionist, to let him know I was there. Jen comes back to me and says, Gary's running late. He said to wait for him. About 30 minutes later, I asked Jen to remind him I was waiting. After a couple of phone calls, Jen says, I can't get through to him in his office or on mobile. His office thinks he's left the building. No one knows where he is. I guess a reasonable person would have just called it quits and left at that point, or called or emailed him, or left a message with Jen or something. But I was sick of Gary's crap. I would learned ages ago that one way to help people with their timekeeping skills was through their wallet. So I went out to my work vehicle, got my laptop and a bottle of water, then went back into the reception area and set up camp in a corner. I had planned an office day anyway to work on quotations and project planning so Gary could pay me to do it. My charge out rate at the time was $110 an hour. Seven and a half hours of very productive spite fueled work later, I called Gary on his mobile, got message bank and left a message saying I waited for him and maybe we could reschedule. The next meeting was arranged for two days later, on site at the empty building at 9 a.m. During the phone call to arrange this, I lightly mocked speed bump by asking if he meant 9 a.m. human time or Gary time. He may have thought we had built some kind of convivial rapport and was just being funny when he said, Well, if I'm not there at 9, why don't you break in and start without me? I was on site 10 minutes early and waited until 9.05 to put the battery in my angle grinder. The stainless steel security mesh over the window made a satisfying sound being cut. After duct taping the whole window, the hammer tapping the glass edges was less satisfying. The best sound that day after gaining entry was the security system siren. I was outside having a smoke with the security response guard when Gary turned up. The wind kind of left his complainy sails when I shrugged and said, Well, you did say. I'd like to close this tale by saying that Gary learned from my interactions with him. But as you'll probably know, speed bumps don't change. You either have to just go around them, deal with them, or remove them. And Gary just continued being a speed bump for some time to come. I didn't cop any serious crap over the seven and a half hour invoice or the damage. However, Gary did delegate one of his staff to work directly with me a lot more after this. It was a small win, but you have to savor those, I reckon. Entitled mother demands I pay her mortgage. So a bit of background. My mom and dad have been divorced for some time now, which leaves my mom as a single parent to me. Since I started working, I've had to pay board and rent to my mom, which of course I have no issues with. However, everyone I've spoken to, work moms, friends, etc., thinks I pay way too much. Since I got my first full-time job, I've had to pay 400 pounds per month to my mom to live at home. This was not discussed prior and I did not get a say on this. She seemed to just pick this number out of thin air. I've questioned where this money actually goes as surely that means the house including bills costs 800 pounds per month so I assume I should be paying half. Every time I try to talk to her about it, she gets super defensive, shouts, and ends up in both of us getting angry and upset. During these discussions and arguments, she keeps mentioning I wouldn't have to pay as much if she had two wages coming into the household. She's referring to my dad not living with us. Surely that's not my problem or my fault. She's also lied to me by giving me different amounts regarding the amount outstanding on the mortgage and amount of bills, etc. Anyways, it goes on. My mom has had a savings account in my name, which she is a trustee of since I was born. She had the money from the government for having a kid put into there, child tax credits in the UK. There's approximately £9,000 in this account, which I appreciate is a lot of money. I was told growing up I would receive this when I turned 18, however, this never happened. May I also add here the fact that my mom has stated that this is her money and she put it in a trustee savings account with my name as the beneficiary to avoid my dad taking half should they split up, which eventually they did. My mom had stated numerous times she would like to get this withdrawn as she wants this money transferred to her bank account to pay her mortgage off, which she states has a shortfall of £9,000. Again, when she's mentioned the outstanding balance on the mortgage, the number changes drastically, so I'm not sure I believe her. I contacted the bank to see where I stand, and they stated that legally the money is mine, as it has been saved and earned interest in my name. They said it would have to be put into a bank account in my name to be released, which is what I did. 
I had the money put into my bank account to put into a savings account each month to earn interest on. However, my mom wasn't happy about this and said she felt blindsided as she wanted the money to be transferred into her bank account for the mortgage. She stated that she wants the money when the savings account is finished, but I can keep any interest earned. The savings account is only a one-year account and is due to end in the coming months. So I'm just looking for some help on what to do in this situation as she's again mentioned the money in my savings coming to an end. I should also mention that my mom is most definitely not struggling financially. She had me set up a direct debit into her savings account from her bank and I couldn't help but see the balance in her account. She could buy the house again at the original price and still have money left over. I'm totally lost right now. Do I give her the money? Do I give her half? Do I tell her it's legally my money and I don't have to give it to her? Money is a difficult thing to talk about at the very best of times and sometimes brings out the worst in people. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Nope, that's your money. Put into a trust for you. You don't owe it to your mother. She sounds very, very greedy and entitled. Don't give her anything, OP, and move out of her house ASAP before she, edit, manipulates you into surrendering access to your bank account. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you give the money to your mom or not? Please let us know. I'd give her a knuckle sandwich is what I'd give her. Am I the jerk for canceling the family trip after what my wife did? I, male 42, have two boys, Adam who's 16 and Leo who's 14. Their mom passed five years ago and I married my wife Rose about a year ago. Rose adores both of my boys but complains about Leo being overly uptight and closed up. It's true he likes to keep to himself, doesn't participate in most family functions but that's just how he is. My wife has taken it personally and kept saying that Leo clearly doesn't like her and or doesn't like spending time with her. What she started doing was trying to exclude him from events under the excuse of he wouldn't be interested anyway, which I thought was wrong because he's picked up on that and started asking why. So I told my wife to just do her part and that giving him the choice to decide whether he wants to participate or not and not outright exclude him. I'd been arranging for a family trip and days ago I booked tickets and hotel reservations upon deciding our destination. Note that I was paying for the entire thing, but the day of the trip I found out that Leo's ticket had been cancelled. I was dumbfounded to discover it was my wife who cancelled it. I immediately confronted her and she said she figured Leo wouldn't want to come, but she knew he said he would go. She tried to argue that due to his moody personality and introverted nature, he had changed his mind last minute or go on the trip but turned it into a miserable experience for us all. I got so mad at her, especially after she tried pressuring me to leave him with his aunt. I canceled the entire trip, all tickets, all reservations, everything. She blew up at me and started lashing out. I had the boys unpack and I did the same which made her go crazy and yell at everyone in the house. She went to stay with her sister while exposing what I did to the rest of the family who thought I made a big deal out of it and shouldn't have canceled the trip that I promised the whole family. Edit. I'm planning another trip with the boys, without my wife, but right now there's huge conflict in the family and even Adam is upset and blames Leo for what happened. I'm trying to get everyone to calm down and then we'll see where this goes. Edit. I've decided, and following some opinions here, to speak to Adam to see exactly why he blames Leo for what happened. He just got home and I'm about to get him into a separate room for a private talk to be able to hear his side and find out why he feels this way. Edit. I spoke with Adam. Turns out, Rose told him I canceled the trip after Leo changed his mind last minute and that I decided to cancel it for everyone else and fought with her when she tried to convince me to go anyway and let Leo stay with his aunt. This is just, I don't know what to say. To be frankly honest, Adam didn't even want to talk but I told him we needed to talk. He and Leo aren't speaking right now because of this and I'm struggling trying to clean up this mess. I was actually thinking about calling Rose, but after this, I've decided I need more space than she does. I will have the boys sit together. It's hard to do, but I'll try and talk this out so I can focus on the other major issue I have with what Rose did. Not the jerk. Your wife canceled your son's reservation because she didn't want to go on vacation with him. Your son's 14. He lost his mother and then had to adjust to you getting remarried. Your wife is the jerk and canceling the trip was the right thing to do. Plus, it's his personality. Introverted people, even with the closest friends, are a bit restrained, so why would it be any different with a woman that took his mom's place? She's just too immature to handle him. I myself am an introvert, 
Very quiet and semi-antisocial. But I have friends who are the same and we're just all comfortable around each other. Rose has a total misconception that all kids are just always outgoing and chipper or whatever goes on in her head. And the fact Leo immediately picked up on her completely isolating him with a lame excuse proves it was a bad influence. It's always the quiet ones who are the most observant. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Rose? Please let us know. I'm surprised Reddit's not freaking out telling OP to get divorced. A million dollars worth of malicious compliance. I actually finally have a malicious compliance story of my very own. This happened just last night. I'm a mid-level boss for a second shift in a distribution warehouse. Among the many things I'm in charge of, the biggest is billing. I invoice all the orders after they're picked and loaded on trailers to be sent to the customers. Keeping all the boring technical details as small as possible, the billing system is called an ASN. It's clunky, outdated, and absolutely asinine in how it operates. If one single order is missing or has an error, it will crash the system and not put through any of the orders. So one billing error will cause 400 to 700 orders, around 8,000 to 15,000 pieces of product, around 15 to 20 trailer loads to not be billed or sorted to routes or sent. The orders come in four batches called POs. So last night we're working on the first PO when the warehouse manager comes to me and tells me that a customer ordered late and they've generated a fifth PO just for their order, but that they're coming in person tomorrow morning and that the day shift will pick it, only 10 pieces. He tells me when it prints out to just set it on his desk. Don't pick it or bill it. He'll handle it in the morning. I immediately tell him that if it's going to print on second shift's POs, then it will be in the system under our ASN, and that if I don't bill it, it will hit the system as a missed order and will crash the ASN. He looks at me indignantly and says it won't because a fifth PO is after ours and will be in the system on the next days. I tell him that's not how it works. He insists and says just to do it. His shift is over and he wants to go home. I give him a hearty, yes sir, and go about my night. After the order printed, I set it on his desk as instructed and sent him an email on the company computer stating that his direct instructions had been followed. Normally I'd have texted it, but I wanted proof in the company's email. Needless to say, in the wee hours of the morning after my crew was home in bed, the ASN crashed over the missing order and just under a million dollars of product was frozen in limbo. No money was charged. No customers received their pre-July 4th orders. My company ate the costs of everything, including the transportation costs, drivers, lumpers, dock workers, pickers, payroll, and all the other expenses of a large warehouse nightly operations. This morning, the warehouse manager called me, and to his credit, he didn't try to throw me under the bus, possibly helped along by my email proof. But he's always been a generally upfront kind of guy. He just sheepishly told me I was right, and crap had hit the fan. He's been there forever, so I doubt he'll get fired, but I know he'll be getting chewed out from corporate today. If you're going to run a multi-million dollar operation on an outdated goober system, don't argue the one goober who knows how to make it run. I can only make deposits, withdrawals, and buy money orders? My previous mid-sized, obscure bank merged with another slightly bigger but equally obscure bank several years ago. All the familiar, friendly faces were replaced by younger, less than friendly staffers. I walk in and ask one of the tellers to change my $20 paper bill to quarters. I need a bunch of quarters because the building that I worked in had quite a vending machine. I'm talking cinnamon buns, coffee cakes, gourmet hot chocolate, etc. The building owner imported the machine from Japan. There's just one problem. It's very temperamental when it comes to paper bills. It eats bills constantly. Sometimes bills get mangled and shredded. The teller, let's call him Cletus, looked at me the same way that someone would look at a bunch of junk mail. Cletus. We don't do that here. The previous staff may have done so in the past, but as you know, we've absorbed this branch, and we can't accommodate unusual requests such as yours unless you have a merchant or a business account. He wasn't making eye contact now and was just fiddling about with his keyboard and monitor cables. His next words were the ones that set me off. Cletus. I can help the next person in line. It's on. Me. Wait a second, I have a few questions about my account. What am I allowed to do? Cletus. <sighs> Withdrawals, deposits, buy money orders. Me. Any restrictions or limits on how many times I can do it? Cletus, now speaking very fast and very animated. 
no restrictions, any denomination. You just can't walk up and ask us to make change for whatever cash you walk into the branch with. Okay, I'm happy to comply. Here we go. Me, I'd like to make a withdrawal. I'd like $100 in 20s, another $100 in 10s, another 100 in 5s, and another 100, but this time I'd like 80 singles and $20 in quarters. Cletus, fine. Like I said, any kind of withdrawal or deposit is fine for your type of account. He counts everything in front of me, hands me the cash, and asks, Anything else, boss? I pocket the $20 rolls of quarters and say, Yes, I'd like to deposit $380 to my account, please, chief. I vividly remember his shoulders drooping and his eyes closing in disgust. Needless to say, I closed my account the next time that I stopped by. Am I the jerk for telling my son and his girlfriend I'm not raising his kid while we were at a family party? I'm 35, male, and I have a 17-year-old son. I had him very young and wasn't all that present in his life at first, so I wasn't much of a father for the first two years of his life. His mom and I then got back together and she passed a year ago. He and his girlfriend are now expecting a baby that was obviously a surprise. His girlfriend moved in with us. They're both still in school and plan to go to college. When they told me about the baby, my son said that since I work from home, they can still go to school and get their degrees while I take care of the baby. I told them many times that I will not be raising their kid and they need jobs. They can do part-time jobs with school and get two jobs over the summer to save up some money. They're both mad about it, but we didn't discuss it anymore. We all went to my brother's birthday party and the whole family was there. My son's girlfriend decided to announce the pregnancy there to everyone. She's four months pregnant. Everyone was a bit shocked, but congratulated them. And then my brother joked to me, Wow, Grandpa at 35, you could be the baby's dad. Girlfriend then said, Well, he will be helping out with the baby a lot, so he will be like an honorary dad. And everyone laughed. My son then said, Let's make a toast to my dad, who will help me out by caring for my kid at the beginning, to make up for the time he missed out on the first time around, when he was a baby. I told them right then and there that I will not be raising or supporting this kid financially and if they want to have it, they need to get jobs and grow up. They were both upset, especially his girlfriend. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but short of kicking them out, I don't know what your leverage is going to be once the baby is born. Are her parents in the picture? Agree with this. They were trying to manipulate you into raising and financially supporting the kid while you also support them. I'm glad you stood your ground. The thing is, once a baby is born, it's usually more difficult for someone to say no. So maybe setting clear ground rules early is good, and make sure to stick to them. I also agree with the above point about short of kicking them out, what will your leverage be? It's not easy for a caring parent to turn a kid away. Throwing out some thoughts here, not saying you have to do them. Would setting up deadlines to have a job or income help? Would charging them rent help? I was thinking either one, very minimal amount, definitely nowhere near what market rates are, but to give a little push to earn an income. Or two, charge a minimal rental, but that amount is going into something like a jar at home that can be used towards baby formula, diapers, etc. But they also should not dump the baby shopping and care onto you too. It still should be them doing it. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for not wanting to raise his son's kid or not? Please let us know. You want to act like grown folk? You better take care of yourself like grown folk. Am I the jerk? I went on vacation with my friend and her family and they kicked me out. I got my own room and stayed. I'm in college and my roommate from last year, Meg, whose family is really rich, said she could bring a friend on vacation. It was kind of awkward. I was her third choice, but her family vetoed the first two because they didn't want her bringing a boy or this other friend of hers that they disliked. Her parents bought my plane ticket and booked the resort, which I was very grateful for, and I saved a lot of money up so that I could make sure I buy my own food and activities when I'm there and treat her family to a dinner as a thank you for the ticket. But when the trip started, it was just bad. It was her, me, her mother, her father, two of her father's friends, and her three brothers going. On the flight, they all got first class and got me an economy seat, but I didn't say anything because why argue about a free ticket? The first night they went to a grocery. It turns out they wanted to cook at the resort kitchen for the whole trip. And by they wanted to cook, it actually turns out that they wanted me and Meg to cook. I wasn't warned about this, but it turns out Meg's family is so traditional that they thought the cooking was our job and her mom had just had hand surgery. 
so it was me and Meg cooking every meal for six men and her mom. And I can't cook well. I know a couple staple meals to feed myself, but since I rarely eat meat, I don't know how to cook it. I'm also okay at cooking for one or two, but have no practice cooking for a group of nine. I messed it up, undercooked chicken, and overcooked some steak, and her dad was angry with me. I got short with him and told him that if he knew how to do better, he could pitch in instead of standing around criticizing. But he got furious and said he was on his vacation. I said that I was trying to have a vacation too, or did they invite me just to be an unpaid domestic servant? Meg's parents and dad's friends got angry I said that and started yelling at me. The argument escalated. I sarcastically called myself the help. Her dad snapped at me and told me to get out of their suite and go home. Didn't say anything about how he expected me to do that. I left and called the airline with my ticket and asked them if they could do anything to prevent anyone else from modifying or canceling my ticket. They let me set a passcode and no changes could be made to the flight without it. Then I went to the resort desk to ask about rooms, saying I was stranded unexpectedly. They actually did have some affordable rooms available because of a weekday discount, so I got housing and still had money left over for touristy stuff. I went sightseeing and relaxed on the beach for three days until Meg's parents ran into me. They were taking a sunset walk and did a double take seeing me on the beach. They said that they thought I was going home and I said I decided to stay. They were angry because they saw me staying and using the return flight as having deceived them into thinking I couldn't afford a vacation and using them for flights when I could have actually afforded things. Am I the jerk for staying on that vacation and using the flight home? Not the jerk. This is no way to treat the friend of your kid. Also, it's no way to treat your kid. What on earth? Your poor friend. Not the jerk. Too bad Meg didn't leave with you and let pops and bros do the cooking. Poor Meg's family may have money, but they don't have class. Am I the jerk for creating a scene at my birthday and refusing to cut the cake because the cake was bought not considering my choice? I, 17 female, had my birthday three days ago. The birthday party was arranged at my own place. I have two maternal cousins. Let's call them Namif, 15 male, and Ella, 13 female, who love vanilla cakes a lot. They don't hate chocolate cakes, but they always prefer vanilla over chocolate by a high margin. I've always hated vanilla cake since childhood. I never liked the smell or the taste, none of it, and I've always preferred and loved chocolate cakes. So obviously, I wanted a chocolate cake for my birthday instead of a vanilla cake, which I won't even be able to eat. The arrangement was almost done and it was time to buy the birthday cake. I told my mom, let's go together and buy the cake. My maternal uncle, 42 male, then said that he will go, choose and buy the cake with Namif and told me not to go because it's really hot outside with 36 degrees Celsius or 99 degrees Fahrenheit. I and my mom both said we will go and buy it because I want to choose my own birthday cake. My maternal uncle then assured me that he will buy the cake according to my choice, which I will love. Seeing me since childhood, he knows I don't like vanilla cakes. Again, my mom reminded him not to buy a vanilla cake and to buy chocolate cake instead. I also told him to buy chocolate cake. Then after a while, my maternal uncle came back with the cake. I opened the box with interest and curiosity and saw it was a big vanilla cake. I looked at him with a confused face and he said, I bought it because Namif loved it and chose the cake for you. Then I said nothing and went to my room. My mom came after me and I told her that I will not celebrate my birthday and I won't cut the cake. Hearing this, my maternal uncle came and started saying, Elders should always sacrifice for their youngers. You're Namif's elder sister and you can't sacrifice just a cake for him. It's like the thousandth time I've hearing this. You should sacrifice for your youngers. Thing from him. Hearing this, I got even more mad and said, Okay then, I should as well sacrifice cutting the cake and let him, my brother, cut the cake. My point was, why the heck am I supposed to sacrifice at my own birthday? Not to mention I'm celebrating my birthday after four years. Then I started saying how I felt and how their mentality sucks and said I won't cut the cake. Then my maternal aunt started saying I'm the jerk, I'm childish and selfish, and they won't ever attend my birthday. Am I the jerk? Update. After the vanilla cake was bought and I reacted, at first mom told me to keep the peace for the sake of the guests and said that she will talk to uncle later about this crappy deed of his after guests are gone and the party's over. But when my aunt started calling me a jerk and childish and selfish, immature, etc., 
my mom lost her cool and defended me. For that, my mom and aunt had a huge fight, for which my uncle, aunt, along with cousins, left the birthday party. After they were gone, my mom, my best friend, and I went to my favorite cake shop and bought a big, cute chocolate cake from there. Later, the birthday went good. Had a classic case of don't judge a book by its cover, both on my side and the customer's side. So the other day, I get a foretop of older ladies that had a million questions about the beers and ciders. I was able to answer all of them and offered a taste of one cider on tap. Sorry, ladies, I can't offer tastes of the rest since they're in cans. They don't like the cider, so I ended up getting them generic beers of their choice. So I'm like, great, sorry that you had to settle for what you didn't want. Anyways, still getting confused and what seems like judgmental looks after running back and forth to the bar for them, I assumed it was my tattoos and stuff. I don't have many tattoos, only six visible ones, but I also have a lip ring and a septum ring, so I felt like these ladies were kinda giving me dirty looks. I'm just like, whatever, they're old, they don't get it, blah blah blah, and I don't care what people think about me anyways, so just go about my time. I'm pretty busy, but pay special attention because they're ordering multiple drinks and they're all super specific about their orders. When I drop off their food, super specific mods, etc., the lady who I thought was giving me dirty looks stops me and asks me about my leg tattoo, Captain Spaulding from House of a Thousand Corpses. So I explain that he's my favorite horror clown, rest in peace Sid Haig, and she asks me if I've seen the other movies from Rob Zombie. I was in shock, like, how does this 70 year old woman know this? So obviously I got super excited. Another lady at the table asks me about my two forearm tattoos, which are both Steve and Gamel illustrations, spooky stuff. Anyways, the lady I thought hates me ends up telling me that Halloween is her favorite holiday, and we talked about Halloween for a long time because it's obviously my favorite holiday too. They ended up being my favorite table of the day, and I made an extra $20 because their car died in the parking lot and I let them use my jumper cables. I tried really hard to not accept the extra 20, but the ladies insisted. One of my favorite examples of don't judge a book by its cover. Me for judging older ladies with super specific mods and wanting to taste lots of things, and then because I'm happy, they didn't judge me on my appearance. So that's my story for the day. Cheers, everyone. Edit. I didn't realize that calling 70-year-old people old would be such a big deal. If I can paint a bigger picture, these ladies looked like they were in a typical ladies' day type scenario, super proper and buttoned up, ready for a fancy lunch, which isn't common for a pizzeria. Sorry if I've offended anyone by calling them old, I really didn't mean anything by it. And if I may reiterate, I loved these ladies in the end, and if I had them at my table again, I'd be so stoked to have them. Psycho Karen gets kicked out of our hotel. Good evening, class. I hope we're all ready for today's lesson. Today, we're going to learn how to get kicked out of a hotel. Now, for the two big jerks in this lesson, we will call them Karen and Kelly because these are some of the most entitled jerks I think I've ever met. It all started when I came into my normal work shift. It was a normal start to my shift, manager gut punching me and my GM asking why we hit each other. I mean, why not? When my manager left, something minor happened that needed a detailed note. While doing that, Karen came into the building. Karen. My key isn't working, and that jerk from this morning made it worse. Oh my, I thought to myself. Me. Oh, I'm sorry for that, ma'am. I can remake that for you. I just need an ID, and... I don't have an ID. It's in my room, and I'm locked out of my room. This is BS. Do your job better. She turned around and went down the hall. She was staying on the bottom floor, and as she was walking, she yelled at me. Forget you. Oh my, lovely. I heard her knocking on her room door. Her sister Kelly was in there. So I go to the back and text both of my managers about what happened. They said if Karen comes back and is doing the same thing, put my foot down and tell her not to talk to me like that or she will be removed. Cool, simple, love it, awesomeness. Karen comes back. She exits her room, slams, and I mean slams that door, and comes in the lobby screaming. Me, ma'am, do not talk to me like that. If you continue, you will be removed from the hotel. Karen. I am talking to you however I want to talk to you. I am the customer. Me. Do not talk to me like that at all. Now please hand me your ID so I can remake your keys for you. No, you're going to listen to me and I'm going to tell you how to do your job because I was a manager at a hotel. Me. 
Do not talk to me like that again. If you do it one more time, you will be removed from the hotel. This is your last warning. Karen, you will be mean to me. Take my keys now. Me, ma'am, Karen. No, 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 shut up. I am talking, you hear me? Do not interrupt me. I'm really holding my tongue now. Karen, that is what I thought. This is why my keys don't work. The jerk this morning didn't remake both of my keys at the same time. So explain to me, since this one isn't working now, but the other one does. Me. So that key in your hand was working the whole time since my coworker remade it? Karen. You're not going to apologize to me? I was done being nice. Me. I'm not apologizing to you at all. I didn't do anything to you at all. You literally came in here screaming and cussing at me over your key. Give me your ID, give me the keys, so you can go to your room and leave me alone. No, apologize to me now, you hear me? Me. ID, please. Stop interrupting me. ID. No, listen to me. I will listen once you give me your ID. She gives me the ID, I make her keys, I give her the keys. I'm ignoring her now. Karen. Your parents didn't raise you right. Who talks to a customer how you do? You're a poor excuse of a person. I turn to walk off to text my managers. Karen. Wow, really? You interrupted me and everything? Now you're ignoring me? I am trying to say sorry to you. Worst apology ever. She kept yelling at me from the front desk. I was texting my managers about everything. It got to the point I turned the corner and said, Go to your room now. I'm not talking to you at all. Karen gets angry and starts cussing and yelling more and goes to her room and slams the door. GM calls me. Me. Meow Hotel, how can I help you? GM. Transfer me to that room now. Me. Okie dokie. Not sure what happened after that, but my manager called me next. Manager. What exactly did you say to that woman? Me. I told her to stop talking to me how she is. Told her if she doesn't stop, she will be removed from the hotel. I kept asking for ID and she kept screaming like a five-year-old. Manager. You said nothing inappropriate to her? Me. No. Why? Manager. She said she recorded you and that she has evidence of you getting violent and saying inappropriate things to her. Dumbfounded, I tried really hard not to giggle. Me. She just dug her own grave. Manager. Yeah, it sounds like it. Transfer me to the room. I transferred. Ten minutes later, I get a call from our customer service complaint line. Kelly in the room called them. The woman who was dealing with the case said, She said you attacked her sister over the counter and said very inappropriate things to her. I told the lady to give me a case management number and pass it on to the managers. This is in their hands now. I texted it to them and told them what the case woman said. GM calls me back and said, I want them out now. Heck no, I am pulling up the security cameras. I transferred her to the room, manager called me next, and was ranting about how she should have kicked out that woman earlier this morning. This wasn't the first issue with her, I guess. GM calls me back and said they have 15 minutes to get out. She told them about the cameras. She said Karen started yelling and cussing at her, and sometimes was just screaming, which I could hear down the hallway. GM told them if they come to the desk to talk to me, GM was currently watching the cameras, watching them leave. She told them if they come to the desk to talk to me, she would be calling police for harassment and disturbance of the peace, and she will throw trespassing on top of it, because GM and manager told them leave multiple times each. They went out the back doors, never stopped by the desk. Kelly and Karen quietly left, and I sat in the back room singing show tunes and doing homework. Was I upset over her yelling and screaming at me? Oh yeah, big time. When you yell and scream at me like she did, I started violently shaking. I was violently shaking and in the employee's bathroom trying not to throw up because, ah. Moral of this story, don't be a jerk and don't do drugs. I don't know if drugs were involved, just don't do them though. I love you all, you all get an A+. Karen demanded to get me fired because I refused to sell her skinny jeans. Background info. My name is Sean. This story happened at Walmart in January of this year. I used to work at Walmart in September, but I quit to go work at my sister's donut shop. At Walmart, I worked at the register. I would see this woman from time to time. I actually ended up being good friends with her. She was chill to me and most people all the time, and she was really just cool in general. We would hang out after my shifts sometimes, and I loved being around her. Alright, now on to the main story. In January, I was at Walmart looking for a Lego set I've been trying to get for a little less than a year. When suddenly, 
For the sake of this story, we'll call her Karen. She walks up to me. Hey, Sean, it's been a week or two since we last talked. She would randomly pop up out of nowhere and scare me like that. This was one of those times. Oh, hey, it has. She quickly interrupted me, which was weird since she would usually let me speak first. But I thought nothing of it since we've known each other for so long. So, I found these amazing skinny jeans that I need so badly, but they don't have them in my size. Can you go check in the back for me? She was talking in one of those snobby Karen voices you would hear in an MK video. Oh, uh, sorry Karen, but I quit my job last month. With that annoying Karen voice, she said, <laughs> You've always been so funny, Sean. But for real though, can you check the back and see if you guys have this in a size 18? Karen seemed really off today and this confused me because she's always been really happy. Oh, I'm not joking. I really did quit last month after Black Friday. I can't really handle that many people. I don't know if something just clicked in her head, but she just went off on me for no reason at all. All right, Sean, enough jokes. If you don't get these jeans in my size, I will get the manager and have you fired and banned from all Walmarts. She was really causing a scene, and I could even see somebody recording from afar. Karen has never really yelled at anybody that I've seen, so this was really confusing and actually kind of scary for me. Whoa, Karen, calm down. I really don't work here anymore. Why else would I not be in uniform? Which she responded with, Well, maybe it's because you're just trying to pull a prank on other people. Well, guess what, Sean? It's not funny, and I'm going to get the manager. At this point, I'm just standing in the toy aisle, completely confused and embarrassed with all the people that are staring at me. A few moments later, my old manager came with Karen. Let's call him Bob. Now, Bob was the best manager ever. We would hang out any chance we got, but after I quit, we kind of slowed down. We're still in touch, though. Here he is. Hey, Sean, Bob is here to fire you. Bob came up to me and said, Hey, Sean, it's been a while. How you doing? Yeah, I broke my arm a while back, but other than that, I'm fine. Karen looked shocked and so confused, which kind of made me cackle a bit. Bob told Karen, Hey, lady, Sean actually quit a month ago, so he doesn't work here anymore. Of course, Karen's hate being denied, so she said, Even the manager is in on the prank? I'm out of here. Karen stormed out, and after that, I never heard from her again. This whole situation was so weird and out of character for Karen, so I'm still kind of confused as to why she flipped out on me. If she sees this post, chances are she's going to sue me for harassment. Also, I'm pretty sure she stole the skinny jeans that weren't even her size, nor were they the proper size for skinny jeans. Edit. A ton of people are confused on how my arm magically healed so fast, but prior to when the story takes place, I was able to get my cast taken off since it had been four and a half weeks since I broke my arm. Without my cast, it wasn't too obvious that my arm was broken. Hope this helps clear things up. Would I be the jerk if I contact my biological siblings to let them know I exist against the wishes of my biological parents? I'm male, 18. I was adopted by a couple who separated shortly after my adoption, and I was eventually taken away from them and placed into foster care when I was three. That's where I grew up. Recently, I've acquired details about my biological parents from a family friend who helped connect them to my adoptive parents all those years ago. I looked them up online. They have three kids, a son who's 15 and twin daughters who are 13. The son has the same name as me. A few weeks ago, I went to the church they go to and I saw them from a distance. I didn't introduce myself, just wanted to see them before they knew who I was. Also figured out where they live. About two weeks ago, I finally sent a message to my mom explaining who I am and telling her that I would like to meet them. She saw the message that day but didn't reply for a whole week and then just sent a very short message telling me they're not interested in getting to know more about me or having me in their lives, to not contact her or her family ever again. I sent a message to my dad then and he said we can have a phone call. We had that call last week. He didn't even let me tell him anything about myself. He explained that they had had me when they were 22 and didn't want a kid back then so they gave me to another couple and there really isn't anything for us to discuss. He said he doesn't want to know more about me and doesn't want to hear from me again. I'm not going to lie, this was difficult for me to hear and I had a few days to process it. But I get it, they didn't want me then and they don't want me now. I'm trying my best to just get over it, but I still have three siblings. Maybe they would want to get to know me. So I sent another message to my dad, thanked him for taking the time to speak with me and being frank about what he wants. 
I explained that I respect the fact that he and my mom don't want me in their lives, and that's their choice, and I will respect that. However, I have three siblings, and I would like to meet and get to know them. He called me an hour later, this time he was angry, and told me that he made it clear that I have no place in their family and I should stay away from all five of them forever. He said the kids don't know about me and it will stay that way. I wasn't expecting him to call me or the aggression, so I was kind of shocked, but I was like, but that should be their choice, and he said he's not going to discuss his family with me. Ended the call with saying, do not contact any of us ever again. Would I be the jerk if I went to talk to my siblings, introduce myself, and let them know that they have an older brother? I'm obviously not trying to be a jerk here, but I don't think the parents get to make this decision about their kids. I do want a relationship with my siblings, of course only if they want that too. If my siblings don't want to get to know me, I'll stay away from all of them. You would be the jerk, but not once the eldest turns 18. Reach out to him then and he can decide whether to tell his sisters. If he doesn't, reach out to them when they turn 18. Just be sure to respect any boundaries they set. I'm just curious why you want all this. Is it to fill a void within yourself? That's never a good reason to disturb someone else's peace. I think you should respect their decision. If they want to tell their kids about you, that's their choice. They are the parents and they know what's best for their family unit better than you do. It may be a bridge they are waiting to cross once their kids are adults, and by then they may have the mental fortitude to be able to handle this information and make the decision for themselves. Not gonna lie, you are coming off a bit bitter. It sounds like you weren't lost in the system. I won't say I know your life, but unless you suffered something really bad as a result of your adoption, perhaps appreciate they made what was likely a difficult but better decision for your well-being. You're the jerk already by how cold and calculated you've been so far, going to their church to measure them up, doing background research and figuring out where they live and details of work and schooling. These are some serious red flags here about your behavior, OP. Everyone here sucks as well. The parents are certainly jerks too. Soft, you're the jerk. You don't have the right to disturb this family when not everyone is adults and the two adults in the family have made it clear they don't want you to be involved in it. It sounds like you'd want to just cause chaos and call out your bio parents for something that isn't really anyone's fault. They accidentally got pregnant. It's understandable that you want to know them and connect with them, but the parents of those kids have made it clear they don't want you doing that. You're also somewhat endangering their emotional and mental health by just coming by with serious information. You could get in trouble for harassment because that is what you're essentially doing. Wait until they're 18 and see what happens or just move on. Make your own family. Do a 23andMe and find out whatever from your genes. But don't harass people who don't want you there. It's bordering unhinged behavior to threaten your biological parents for not wanting to open up the can of worms that you kind of are. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his biological parents? Please let us know. I think the jerks are these commenters on Reddit. Don't you people have hearts? But the parents too, they really, really suck. If you don't like it, leave. I worked as a waiter at this Italian restaurant in New York City in the early 2000s. The restaurant is now closed and we'll get to that. I, 22, male at the time, was in my fifth year working there and new ownership took over. The restaurant wasn't doing as well as it used to, but it still had a loyal base. 40 plus year history and good location. The old owners were just getting older and built a new restaurant in New Jersey closer to home. The new owners were Mike and Jerry. Names changed blah blah blah. Jerry was the one with the restaurant experience and was pretty quiet, a bit of a nerd and by the books. Mike was a mechanic and was somewhat unpredictable but also fun to be around for the most part. Most of our client base at this restaurant were families, older couples and basically middle class people from the neighborhood. Honestly, it was the best Italian food in the borough for the price in my opinion. I loved it as someone who worked there in his early 20s because I worked 5 p.m. to 10 Friday and Saturday and Monday all day and made around $300 to $400 a week, back when minimum wage was $5.50 an hour. Pretty darn good for a college kid with few to no bills. Now, there were only a few other waiters and waitresses. James, who left because he became a teacher. Tom, who left because he became a fireman. Will, who was about to leave to become a court officer or something. Erica, a cute new girl. Agnes, older housewife who worked there for 25 plus years. Jill, another older and beloved waitress who worked 25 plus years there. And me, that's it. So we had new owners and some key spots needed filling. We were on a skeleton crew and I was picking up extra shifts as was Erica. Most of these waiters who were leaving were there for like six plus years. 
the customers liked seeing the same faces. Well, Mike and Jerry, the new owners, decided they wanted all young waiters and waitresses, so they fire Agnes and Jill. The customers were jolted and unhappy. Now, context aside, Erica and I were working a party of about 22 people. It was the last table of the night. When the bill was settled and Erica and I cleaned up, we asked Jerry for the tip. There isn't a tip, he said without lifting his face from his paperwork. Now, for parties of five plus, I always included the tip unless it was a customer I knew and trusted. I made the bill and I knew there was a tip. I asked Jerry again and he meekly said, no tip. Now, Erica and I were privately discussing how this is BS and in comes Mike. He begins screaming at us. You think we stole from you? He yelled, red face. We don't steal. You accusing us of theft? He continued aggressively yelling the same thing over and over until he said, if you don't like it, then quit. He then stormed off. Now, I should mention that my best friends all moved to California months before this, and I had plans of moving there with them next month. I didn't give my two weeks notice yet because it was four weeks out. I told Erica this. Yeah, forget this place, she said. As we were packing up to leave, Jerry came over and gave us our tip with no explanation. Weird. Then Mike calmly said, So, see you tomorrow? No, I said calmly. I quit. Me too, Erica said. Okay, Mike said, deadpan. Well, it wasn't okay. They now had no waiters in a restaurant that needed at least four to five to function. Even if you pulled someone off the street, they don't know the system, the menu, the customer base, the wine list, etc. They were done for. They called me incessantly for days afterwards, begging me to come back. I considered it because I could use more money before my big trip to San Diego, but forget them. They even called me throughout the summer asking if I could come in. Sorry, I'm 2,000 miles away, I said. I'm not sure if they believed me, but I was gone. The restaurant only lasted a few more months, and it saddens me because I loved the place. But if you buy an old Italian restaurant with a built-in clientele, don't scare them off by making stupid changes. Now, if I stayed there, would the restaurant have been saved? No, I doubt it. But a lot of customers would have had better dining experiences those last few months instead of the 15-year-old busboys being their new waiters. Am I the jerk for using my husband's car to get to work after he tricked me into going to his family's barbecue party? I, 33 female, am a nurse. I have a very, very busy schedule. It's been absolutely crazy the past couple of years. My husband, male 36, works an office job and because he's a family-oriented type of guy, he always hangs out with his family. His family live on a ranch in the middle of literally nowhere. It's a hassle to go there and due to my work nature, I don't go to most of their functions. I do, however, make sure to attend the big ones. Last week, his family wanted to host a barbecue party. He wanted me to go with him so badly since all his brothers were bringing their wives and since they mocked him for coming alone in the past. I said sorry, but I had a shift to cover. He begged, suggested I swap shifts with other nurses who are my friends and even called them all to beg them to cover for me. I grew irritated and told him to stop it. He sulked for a whole day, but then he dropped it. In the morning and hours before my shift, I discovered that my car's tires were out of air. My husband offered to drive me to the hospital at 4 p.m. and I agreed. I got ready and we got in the car, but instead of taking me to the hospital, he drove me straight to his family's ranch. I was dumbfounded and angry after he said he tricked me into attending this barbecue and that I had to suck it up and set this shift out. I was so mad I didn't even know what to say. We got to the ranch and I sat outside fuming. I waited and saw I still had time to make it to the hospital if I figured out a way to get there. I watched my husband go inside leaving his keychain next to me, right where he was sitting. I took it and rushed to the back where all the cars were parked, got into the car and drove off. His dad saw me and told him. He started calling my phone relentlessly till I turned it off. I got to the hospital in time but didn't dare turn my phone on until it was past 8 p.m. I opened it and saw tons of angry messages from him, loosening it on me, calling me horrible and a manipulator. I got on the phone with him and he yelled about the awful stunt I pulled and bailing from the party and making him look bad in front of his family. He then calmed down and said he now knows that work is more important to me and that he won't ever trust me after I basically stole his car and ran with it. We've been on terrible terms since then. His family are also mad, but I haven't spoken to them about it yet, nor calcified anything. Am I the jerk for what I did? 
I was desperate and worried that messing my shift might cost me my job. Not the jerk. You do know that he was the one that messed with your tires, right? Right. I read that the tires were out of air, and I was like, yeah, sure. Not the jerk. I wonder where he'll take you next time without your permission. Not the jerk. I'm sorry, he called you manipulative? The person that lied to your face to get you to do what he wants you to? On top of this, he prioritizes his leisure time over your career. Don't you dare apologize to him. Feel free to leave him. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. I just want to know why you pronounce barbecue like that. Am I the jerk for refusing to hide my engagement and uninviting my dad to my wedding? I, 33 female, just got engaged to my boyfriend, now fiance, 33 male, of four years. My stepsister, 35 female, stepmother's daughter, is on the slower side mentally, but I don't know exactly what her diagnosis is because her stepmother, slash my dad's wife, is in denial about it all while coddling her at the same time. My stepsister is not dangerous, but she can behave awkwardly and inappropriately and just makes people uncomfortable. She's always had a crush on my boyfriend, now fiance, and has gotten angry whenever we acted like a normal couple. She cries and throws tantrums for hours upon hours over it, so we have been low contact with my father as a result. I called my dad to let him know that we got engaged, and he's wanting me to hide it for a while, to not tell anyone at the 4th of July party we were supposed to go to this weekend, to not put it on social media, and to come to the party without my ring until my stepsister can get used to it. After my dad gently breaks it to her, and he said not to act too close with him at the party. Mind you, we don't do PDA, we just act like a normal couple. I asked him how long he expected us to keep up the charade for, and he said in a very annoyed tone, I don't know, just give us time to break it to her. And I told him, under these conditions, that we would be declining the invitation to the party and all other family events until we're allowed to act like a normal couple, and I absolutely will not hide it on social media. I will put it up just as any other newly engaged couple and let the chips fall where they may. And I said, if he's not going to be 100% supportive of my engagement and marriage, then he does not need to come to my wedding. That I'm not going to disrespect my fiance by acting ashamed of him in public. And I told him in order for us to resume contact, he needs to be publicly supportive of my relationship, not just secretly or under the radar. My stepmother picked up the other line and joined us on the phone. She said, I'm being selfish that I know how hard my stepsister has it, that she'll never have what I do, and I should be understanding and considerate. And my dad basically agreed with her. Although it's none of my business, my stepmom clearly wears the pants in the relationship, so to speak, and my dad will always acquiesce to her. I told them that since they're ashamed of us, that they will never have to worry about justifying our existence to anyone ever again, because we will not be coming around, and they will not be invited to my wedding unless they have an attitude makeover. Let me act like any other normal couple and are 100% supportive of my upcoming marriage and hung up. My dad's side of the family says I'm being insensitive, that my stepsister has it really hard and will never have what I have and I need to be gentle with her. I told them if they want to handle her with kid gloves, that's their prerogative, but I'm going to live my life how I choose and they have absolutely no right to tell me what I can and can't put on my social media. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk at all. So she's in denial about her clear instability and won't treat her or even acknowledge it, but expects you to change your life and your excitement so they don't have to deal with the consequences of not getting her help? B.S. Great choice overall. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. They're being unfair to you and your stepsister. Everything about their behavior is disgusting. If her issues are so severe, you have to act like your partner is a stranger to prevent hour-long tantrums. She needs serious intervention. She's 35, not 5. You're doing the right thing. If you invite them to your wedding, it will become the Placate Stepsister Show, and you don't need any of that. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her dad and stepmom? Please let us know. I don't think I'd want to have anything to do with them, to be honest. To them, coddling her is more important than supporting you and your happiness. Am I the jerk for charging a bride more for makeup when the original price we agreed on was lower? I've been a makeup artist for the past nine years. I charge $500 for bridal makeup, around $250 for bridesmaid, etc. makeup. But for regular party makeup, I charge around $150. So a few weeks ago, a lady had booked me for a party makeup on June 25th. She booked at 10 a.m. I went there thinking I'd do a regular party makeup. I had agreed $150 with her. As I was there, there were some people coming over. I assume relatives. 
At some point, it slips from a woman about the wedding, and I realize the woman I'm doing the makeup on is the bride. I'm doing a bridal makeup, charging for simple party makeup. I was completely upset how she lied about the occasion, but I kept doing my job. After we were finished, she gave me $150, and I notified her we are actually $350 short. She asked what I meant by that, and I said that I did a bridal makeup. You're the bride. That's what I charge for brides. She said we had agreed on a simple party makeup and that I'm basically ripping her off because I worked the same amount of time and used the same products as I'd use in a bridal makeup, so the title of the event shouldn't matter. I told her she doesn't get to dictate how I form my prices. She then refused to pay me at all and called me a scammer and told me to get out. Before I left, her mom threw $200 in my face and told me to get lost. I was telling what happened to my friends and they all sided with the bride and said that unless I used more expensive products and I did extra labor, then I'm not justified in charging her more, and since she requested a party makeup, I should just charge her for that. Am I the jerk? She did not ask for bridal treatment and didn't do a makeup test run. You used the same products you would use on a simple party makeup and attempted to upcharge her $350 for what exactly? Just because she's the bride and you want to squeeze more money out of her? If you used different products or it took way longer, then sure, I could see the upcharge, but you didn't, and it didn't. So yes, you're the jerk. Edit. To those saying OP did nothing wrong, OP stated the only difference in the makeup is setting spray. Unless that spray was made by the gods themselves, it is not worth the $350 upcharge. Edit 2. If anyone can justify why you would charge her more for no extras other than a setting spray, when all she asked for was simply party makeup and didn't demand or ask for more than that, just because she's a bride, then okay. You're the jerk. Once you found out, you should have told her the prices for bridal makeup. And seeing how everything you use for party makeup and bridal makeup is the same other than the setting spray, she was right to call you a scammer. A $350 difference for a couple of sprays to set the makeup, that spray better be made of God's tears. You're the jerk. As a fellow makeup artist, there's absolutely no reason I can see for that massive price disparity. She asked for party makeup. Don't give her anything special beyond that. It was your choice to use the more expensive product, not hers. But even if it wasn't, an extra $350? Come on. You're the jerk in this situation, and you're the jerk in business. She asked for party makeup. You gave her party makeup. She didn't ask for anything extra, and you didn't provide anything extra. So what difference does it make? And after reading your response to other comments, you're the jerk for charging your customers an extra $350 for different setting spray. That's daylight robbery. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her customer? Please let us know. I would have finished the job, taken the payment, and just not worked for them again. It's a Wrangler. During my time selling cars, I sold a lot of Jeep Wranglers. For those who don't know, the Wrangler is purpose-built to go off-roading and really isn't that great of an everyday SUV. My customers who bought a Wrangler and knew what they were getting were happy. My customers who didn't know what they were getting and bought a Wrangler hated it. Had a guy come in with a BMW X5 to trade in and on a Wrangler. I took him on a test drive. I explained the cons of a Wrangler. It's a rough ride, gets horrible gas mileage, doesn't hold in the heat or the cool air very well. It's bumpy, even though it's big, how it's designed can make for a cramped driving and it has a lot of quirks and that's how it's built. It's meant to be that way. This was a Sport S four-door automatic hardtop with a few features like heated seats and we sold it to him for about $45,000. I remember him asking me questions like, are these seats power? No, they aren't. Or, are the seats cooled? I go, no, they aren't. I remember him asking me about features that didn't have a lot. I even remember asking him, are you sure you really want to trade in your X5 for a Wrangler? Well, he did. Over the course of the next several weeks, he would complain to me, wind noise is really loud. Me, it's a Wrangler. It doesn't keep the heat in very well. It's a Wrangler. It's gas mileage is horrible. It's a Wrangler. It's really bumpy. It's a Wrangler. I finally said, would you like your BMW back? He said, you will unwind the deal? I said, no, but you could trade your Wrangler into us and we can sell you your BMW back. He said, all right. He came in, we offered him 40,000 for his Wrangler and we sold him his BMW back for $1,000 more than we paid him for it. When we gave him $40,000 for his Wrangler, he was surprised because he expected our number to be lower, and he asked, why are you giving me $40,000? I said, it's a Wrangler, and he smiled. 
Yes, he basically spent $6,000 to what amounts to renting a Wrangler for six weeks. What do you think about Wranglers? Do you like them or not? Please let us know. I always thought they were kind of cool and kind of used to want one, but after reading this story, I, I think I'll pass. Karen's stepdaughter demands I pay her credit card debt. I have been remarried to my amazing new wife for about six years now. She has moved in with me along with her now 23-year-old daughter. After my most recent divorce, I have saved money aside so that I can put my son through college. He has just turned 18 now. My stepdaughter unfortunately has had difficulties managing her money responsibly. She has gone on shopping sprees during lockdown using the CARE Act stimulus checks from the government to buy herself Louis Vuitton bags and red bottom heels. We understand that she has put herself in a difficult position, that's why we are considering bailing her out just once to help her. My wife says that we should use the money from my son's college fund to bail her out. I refuse to because I've saved that money specifically for my son. My wife is upset as she thinks that we should operate as a team and treat each kid as if they were our own. Am I the jerk in this situation? Edit. Thank you for all of the responses. I didn't realize this post was going to blow up. I have decided I will not be providing my stepdaughter any funds out of my son's college tuition. My wife and I have scheduled counseling to discuss further steps. Rest assured, my stepdaughter will have to learn to cover this herself. Will not be responsible and will not punish my son because of poor spending on her side. Again, thank you for all of the replies. Reject my idea, then praise the dumb idea from the boss's daughter? So, back when I was a university student, I got hired for a summer vacation position at a dog training school to design and maintain their website. It was kind of one of those scammy sorts of certifications that would never land anyone a job anywhere, but it was a thing and the school was actually fairly popular. Now, this was back in the day before MySpace, where GeoCities websites were our own little touch on the internet. If you are young enough to never have had the pleasure of visiting a GeoCities site, here are a few of the common themes. Like the Dawson's Creek theme? Not for long, because your inner ear canal is going to be eviscerated on half the ones you visit with so open up your morning light being shouted at you. All the fonts, all of them, from Comic Sans to Times New Roman, you're going to see them all. Wait, all those fonts are visually appealing. Better make a giant slurry of colors in the background to balance it out. And let's top all of that off with some low res, low FPS GIFs. Utter perfection. Anyway, I was an actually competent web designer and it was clear that their official website was made by a not so competent web designer. It was basically a GeoCity site, posted off GeoCities, which somehow made it worse. That's kind of why they hired me. A lot of their graduating customers in the final survey called the homepage a total mess. The daughter of the owner of the company had designed it, and she was not happy that people disapproved of her work. You see, I was the poor person in the position of cleaning up her crap, and I really did make a valiant effort to be civil about my job, essentially boiling down to undoing her job. You have to understand here that at the end of the GeoCities era, people were beginning to realize that visitors to our websites didn't want to have seizures upon opening them, and the web in itself was gradually moving towards simplicity. Drop-down menus were all the buzz, especially because high-speed cable was not yet popularized, but nobody wanted to load an abomination that reminded them of that god-awful teeny drama with kids who had thesauruses in their back pockets. The owner's sweet baby girl had also apparently caught wind of what they were paying me, which she thought was far too inflated. Their course salespeople were making half the hourly that I was making, so why did they need me when they had her? The jerk drove a brand new Volkswagen New Beetle, so obviously she wasn't hurting for money, but I digress. During our first meeting, she asked me about my plans for the website. I went over how the current website's bones were good, which they most assuredly were not but it could use a more modern touch. I proposed simplifying it, with drop-down menus and so on. During this meeting, the owner's daughter gradually transferred her smug smiles into a sneer, and later on into a full-out scowl. Eventually, she interrupted me, saying that I wasn't there to redesign the site, the purpose for which I was explicitly hired, but to do the tech stuff with her doing the design stuff. In general, people agreed with her. Maybe art director was hidden somewhere in her BS consultant title, but whatever. I realized then that my tenure there wasn't going to last long. To milk out every penny from my paycheck, I suggested that she handle the design side and I build the site. 
Without exaggeration, everything she suggested was bordering on malicious stupidity. I did it all anyway. Barking sounds on clicking links? You got it. Wait, you want me to put how many success story pictures on one page? Well, you're the designer. Yes, I'm fairly sure that D-I-S-I-P-L-I-N-E is the correct spelling after all. No, I'm sure people's 56k internet connections will handle this just fine. A month and a half later, our abomination was complete. She was strangely satisfied, and to this day, I wonder if the entire thing was a ploy to get back at daddy for something. You could legitimately build a better site in the GeoCities web wizard tool. If the job mattered at all to me, I probably would have thrown up in disgust. When it was unveiled, everyone in the company unanimously hated it, and all I could say was that I was just the tech guy. I was soon thereafter let go for unrelated reasons, and a month later when I visited their site, I noticed they had gone back to the old one. Out of curiosity, all these years later I just looked up the school and apparently they still do exist. My act of malicious compliance obviously didn't do any long-lasting damage on them as their new website is about what you would expect from one in 2021. But goodness gracious, I am still proud of myself. Mom takes down the HOA from the inside. My neighborhood does not have an HOA, at least not anymore. When my parents first moved in, my older sibling was maybe two years old and I was a little glowworm. There was an HOA back then. They took money from the neighborhood in exchange for their services. At first, and for quite a while, my parents just kind of shrugged it off. The HOA shoveled the snow off the streets in the winter and dealt with trash collection, so they were doing something worthwhile, right? Ha! No. The city controlled the snow plows and the garbage trucks, not the HOA. But still, there was the illusion of effort. And besides, one summer they decided to contact a company to plant new trees all over the neighborhood. The fact that the company was owned by the son of the head of the HOA was totally coincidental. The trees were the beginning of the end for the HOA. Why? Well, my grandma on my dad's side was visiting when they came around to plant the trees. My grandma, who is a certified master gardener, and so she stared through the windows of our house as the guys planting the trees just dropped the saplings on the grass, still with their roots inside the bag they came in. No holes dug, no holes cut, just a bagged sapling lying on the grass like a pathetic and sad stick. The saplings laid there all night. No one came back to actually do their job and plant them. My master gardener grandma mentioned offhand that those saplings weren't going to make it unless they got in the soil. And something clicked in my mom's head. She was paying the HOA money, actual money, every month, while both she and my dad worked taking care of two kids sending us to daycare and preschool and arranging babysitters and feeding us. And the HOA was just going to pull this crap instead of doing what she's paying them for? No, no way. So she showed up to the head of the HOA's house and basically demanded that the trees be planted properly like she's apparently paying them for. The head of the HOA, so excited for someone actually caring about the neighborhood, made their second mistake. They asked if mom wanted to join the HOA. She agreed. The trees were planted, but most didn't make it. My grandma was right. First things first, mom showed up to the next HOA meeting. There were like five people there. No wonder they asked mom to join. They desperately needed the people. So mom looked at the collection of people who weren't even paying money to the HOA like the rest of the neighborhood. All the contractors the HOA called in were close relatives of other HOA members and weren't paid by the HOA. After all, they're family. So my mom started digging. She spent pretty much a full summer taking down the HOA before she had to go back to teaching in the fall. With me carted along after her and my sibling old enough to be in school or daycare, she dug through the years of paperwork detailing the HOA's financial situation and she found something extremely enlightening. The HOA didn't actually do anything. Well, they didn't do anything to benefit the community. Everything they claimed to do was either covered by the individual homeowner or by the city itself. So they were collecting money from all the neighborhood residents under false pretenses, and actually, they weren't even supposed to be in our neighborhood. Their association zone was a whole different neighborhood. So what is a working mother of two kids to do while her husband is off at work and she's off for the summer? She goes door to door with pamphlets. Me and my sibling in a stroller as she weaves her way through the neighborhood blocks, pamphlets explaining the situation and how to stop paying for services you'll never get. Pamphlets that are, of course, written in both English and Spanish. 
and naturally she got a lawyer and an accountant. It put a major dent in her pocket, but if it meant the entire neighborhood wasn't exploited for money each month, it was worth every penny. Another HOA member helped her sift through the documents and data and pass out pamphlets and encourage people to show up to the meetings, but had to back out because of work-related reasons. My mom rolled up to the courthouse, flanked by the lawyer and accountant, her kids safe at home with her husband, and had more than enough evidence to get the HOA kicked out of our neighborhood, expose the fraudsters for the frauds they were, and make sure that no HOA would ever push their luck in our neighborhood. It's been almost 19 years now, and no one's even tried making another HOA in our neighborhood. Am I the jerk for not letting my sister-in-law wear my wedding dress to prom? I, 25 female, got married to my husband, 24 male, a year ago. He has a sister who's 16. I went a little non-traditional with my dress. I got a big light yellow dress and a beautiful top with lace. The dress was gorgeous and of course very expensive. This was definitely my dream dress. His family isn't particularly well off, but they're certainly not poor or lower income. So when they told me at a family dinner that they were having trouble finding an affordable dress for her, I was a little surprised, but I gave suggestions like looking on eBay, Goodwill's website, etc. In my younger days, I did pageants, and we always resold the dress after at a good discount. They told me they looked but didn't find anything they like. I told them, I hope the dress would come up soon. Two weeks passed, and we get invited to dinner again at their house. We show up, and immediately his sister starts moping. I assume she had a bad day at school and sit down to eat. Then my mother-in-law explained to me she was upset because prom was in three days and she still had no dress. I expressed my condolences and told her that I could maybe help her have some last looks around. That's when mother-in-law said, Oh, I have an idea. OP, why don't you let sister-in-law wear your yellow dress? I could probably get it tailored in time. My sister-in-law immediately perked up and I felt like I was ambushed. I looked to my husband, but he just shrugged. I politely told them I was sorry, but the dress was very special to me, and also sister-in-law and I are quite different sizes. It would fall off of her. Mother-in-law then told me she knows a wonderful seamstress who could make it fit, which really upset me. I asked her, what if I ever want to try it on again? It wouldn't fit me. Even if I lost weight, I would never fit in a dress tailored to fit her. Sister-in-law ended up busting into tears. I'm not sure if it was because of me saying no or me talking about our bodies. My husband and I ended up leaving early. He was very upset with me for not sharing the dress, but said ultimately it was my decision. His family, on the other hand, was livid with me. They went radio silent until I saw a post of sister-in-law on Facebook in a beautiful blue dress. I commented saying I'm glad she got a dress, she looked great, and I hope that she had a good time, and I got a comment back asking me for my portion of the dress. They're now saying my husband and I are responsible for either reselling the dress or getting them half back since I have experience with that or help pay for half. I told them that was ridiculous, but my husband told me to just do it. I told him I'm not going to be pushed over and he ended up leaving for three days to his mom's. Now I'm no longer invited to family dinners or functions and they only have nasty things to say about me, saying I almost ruined her prom night. Am I the jerk? Should I have just let her wear my dress? or at the very least, help them sell it? At this point, since my husband isn't even on my side, I don't know. Edit. Tried to talk to mother-in-law after getting some confidence from these comments. Basically, she brushed it all off. Still demanded I do what she told me to, to either sell it or help pay for it, because I'm family, and that's what family does, but also said she would have looked much better in it than I did, and that I just didn't let her have the dress out of jealousy. I'm honestly speechless right now. Not the jerk at all. Even if it wasn't your wedding dress, it's still your dress and you have no obligation to even loan it out, much less give it away permanently. It makes sense to feel weird because no one is on your side, but it's only this one-sided because it's entirely his family and they clearly have issues. If his solution to them being upset is just give them what they want and his solution to himself being upset is run away to mom's for three days, these are some serious red flags and you might reconsider your future plans with this dude. Exactly. They are super entitled and set this up from the beginning. To expect someone to give you their items simply because you want it is absurd. That your husband doesn't stand up for you is also absurd. Staying with mommy dearest and giving you the silent treatment until you give in to their bullying. OP, you've only wasted a year on this mama's boy and his ridiculous family. I'd cut your losses now rather than looking back in 10 years and knowing this was the first sign that you should have run.
Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you let sister-in-law borrow your dress or not? Please let us know. Never stay with someone who's too weak to stick up for you when it comes to their entitled family. Am I the jerk for telling the stepfather who raised me that he's not my dad? My mom married my stepfather when I was one. He had a one-year-old son, and then they had a daughter a year later together. My stepbrother and I are 16 now, and our half-sister is 14. Stepfather is the only father figure I know, and I've always called him dad. My actual dad is not in my life. Growing up, I always noticed that he treated me differently. He never mistreated me, but he was always more interested in his own kids than me. In fact, he always showed very little interest in me. I've always felt like a second-class family member. My mom treats my stepbrother exactly like me, but my stepfather doesn't do the same for me. Anyway, this last couple of years have been difficult because stepfather started doing stuff with my siblings, like going on trips, going fishing or hiking, bonding moments as he calls it, and he's never taken me with them despite me asking to go. Initially, he always said maybe next time until I called him out last week and he took me aside and explained that this is for him and his kids. I'm not his kid like they are. He said he loves me, but it's different. He can't dilute the experience by bringing me as well, but he said my mom can spend bonding moments with me and my sister if she wants to as well, and that it would be good for us to have that only for us. This conversation happened on Friday before they went off for a weekend trip. My mom told me that this is how he feels. She can't change it, but she's made sure I'm always treated equally when it comes to money, which is true, but she can't change the way he feels, so I need to accept it. I've been thinking all weekend, and it was clear to me that when he doesn't see me as his son, it's wrong of me to see him as my dad. So I decided that if I'm the stepkid he tolerates because of my mom, I'm not going to pretend like we're anything more. I decided to stop calling him dad and go by his first name. So on Sunday night, after they returned, I said, Hi Tom. He was surprised but didn't say anything. At dinner, he asked me what that was about and I explained that I don't want to dilute the experience he has with his real kids by calling him dad when clearly I'm not his son. It's something that should be kept for his actual kids. I was told to go to my room by my mom. Later she came to me and said this has hurt him and I should apologize. I said I'm just following his lead and treating him exactly like how he wants to be treated by his actions. And if he's hurt, then he should look in the mirror because that's his actions. My mom told me in the end that this is the man who raised me all my life and I need to apologize and show remorse. She says he's 95% of the way for being a dad to me. I shouldn't ignore all of that and focus on the missing 5% and reject him entirely. I declined, said he's the one who needs to apologize if he wants things to change between us. Am I being the jerk in this situation? Not the jerk, and well done for sticking up for yourself. If he doesn't want to be your dad fully with no strings attached, then he doesn't deserve the respect of being called dad. Your mom is a jerk. You give your all with kids or nothing. He isn't giving you 95% and has let you know where you stand with him, so it's only fair he knows that respect works both ways. I'm sorry you're dealing with this. You deserve a dad, step or otherwise, who views you as their own and treats you as such. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. I would totally follow your current path and respond with your mom's words back to him. You'll be sure to always treat him politely, but she can't change your feelings on the issue and she and him will just have to accept it. Either the way you feel is fair and each of you need to live with the dynamic created, or your behavior needs to reflect what's fair and right despite your deeper feelings. And I'd tell her and him that you'll be following his lead on how this relationship is going to work. Not the jerk, you're a smart kid. As long as you stay calm and respectful, you're totally in the right in how you're doing this. Also, the fact that your mom told you she makes sure things are kept equal financially tells me she actually has to intervene on your behalf to have that happen. If your mom keeps pushing you, I would very calmly reply by saying, I understand why it bothers you to see his feelings hurt, but I wonder if you've given any thought to how it makes you feel when you see my feelings hurt and why your response to those things is different. Not the jerk. Both your mother and Tom are the jerks. Explain to your mother that this is not just how Tom feels, this is how he acts. If he were a true dad, then he would have the same bonding experiences with you as the others. By letting Tom treat you like this, she's also treating you badly. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of support. Show her this thread and suggest therapy so that she truly understands how damaging this situation is for you and how she is a horrible mother for letting this occur. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Tom? Please let us know. I always knew Tom was a jerk. Remember how he'd always chase Jerry?
Am I the jerk for refusing to return a bag that I bought with my money? I, 19 female, work at a thrift store three days a week. It's quite a big one and a lot of people in my area come and shop there. Every product is labeled in accordance to a color-coded system and the color changes every week. Furthermore, there is a section in the store that sells the more expensive donations, mostly brands. These products are usually sold at a higher price. I'm a very low-level employee and my job is to place the products on the shelves and on the poles. Because of that, I see what is about to be sold in advance. However, I can't buy anything that's labeled with the color of the week. So for example, if this week's color is red, I have to wait until the next week to buy anything with the label in red. Now, I usually work on weekends plus a random day of the week. Two weeks ago, it fell on a Tuesday. That meant that we had just started a new color, yellow. As I was putting bags on a shelf, I realized that one of them was from a very expensive fashion brand. At first glance, you wouldn't be able to recognize it, but because I spend too much time on Pinterest, I immediately started panicking. This bag that usually retails for a few thousand, for sale at a thrift store for $12.99? I was going to faint. Unfortunately for me, because it was labeled in yellow, I couldn't have it. Because it's not the first time this sort of thing happens, I calmed down, put the bag back in its place, and continued my job. As I was going on with my day, I kept going back to the same section, praying that no one had taken it. At the end of my shift, I saw that it was still there, and I decided that, if no one had bought it, I would. Four days later, I came back to start my day, and I see that the bag is still there, but it was now further back on the shelf, behind some other ones. I don't touch anything. I kept doing my job. Did the same on Sunday. Last Monday, I woke up and went there to shop. As soon as I entered the store, I went to the bag section and took the bag, beeline to check out, and bought it. I was so excited. I guess some of my excitement was showing because my coworker asked me why I was smiling. Me and this coworker usually get along well, and I explained to her the situation. She smiled and told me that she was happy for me. Last Saturday, while on my shift, my boss called me into his office to talk. He was with one of my managers, and they went on to tell me that I had acted inappropriately by not notifying them of the price of the bag. They asked that I return it so that they would put it back on sale, this time at a much higher price. I told them no because I followed the policy. They weren't happy, but they couldn't force me. Yesterday when I got to work, my coworkers kept on making remarks and my managers had this unhappy look on their faces. I explained the story to my friend and she said that even if it's my bag, it's not fair that I kept the information for myself. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Policy was followed. Not your fault they didn't check it properly. I worked at a thrift store with a similar system. An OP is definitely not the jerk. We know we have to wait to give customers a chance, and she did. It's the responsibility of the pricers to look this stuff up. They aren't even upset about the customers not getting a chance from the sounds of it. They're just upset they didn't charge more, which makes no sense. If OP was the only one wanting it for $13, why is anyone going to buy it for more? Not the jerk, OP. They're just being greedy. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boss? Please let us know. A lesson to be learned. Be as friendly as you want with your coworkers, but never ever trust them. Only help the people that actually come to church? No problem. Background. I'm a pastor at a small church in the Southeast United States. We have a benevolence fund that church members contribute to, and it's designated to help people in need, such as help with power bills, water bills, rent, etc. At the time this took place, we had about $6,000 in that fund, and we had about as much money coming in as we had going out, so the amount was more or less staying steady over a period of several months. The elder who was in charge of declaring who got help and who didn't somehow got the idea that we were going to run out of this fund if we were not careful, not likely. Therefore, he came to me and said, Pastor, I think we need to restrict our benevolence help to those that physically come to the church, not just those that call in via the telephone. He and I debated this back and forth. There was no issue about people calling in being less likely to be legitimate cases. He was just simply trying to reduce expenditures. His line of reasoning was that at some point, one of our members might need some help for something big, and we needed to make sure that we had plenty of money on hand if and when they needed it. My position was that, one, this money was given with the expectation that we use it to help as many people as possible and not just sit on most of it, and two, we had a really long ways to go before we spent so much that we didn't have any left in reserve. I acquiesced to his suggestion. However, when people started calling in saying that they needed help with something, I told them, 
Okay, here's what I need you to do. Bring your bill and a photo ID to the church between such and such hours, and someone will at least talk to you. I can't promise anything more than that, but someone will at least sit down with you. Never had a single one object to coming in, and they would usually show up shortly thereafter. The church secretary, who agreed with me on this one, overheard me telling this to someone and started laughing, knowing exactly what I was doing. A few weeks later, the elder mentioned to me, You know, we're getting a lot more people coming directly to the church, instead of calling in. Word must have gotten out about how we are doing this. I just replied, Yep, it must have. And then I would just smile and move on. The elder passed on about four years ago, and I don't think he ever clued in as to what I was doing. Am I the jerk for refusing to let my future baby half-sibling live in the same room as me? I'm 17, female, and my mom and stepfather recently got pregnant. My family is kind of confusing, so to sum it up, my older half-brother, 19, he's my stepfather and my mom's kid, and I'm my mom and my dad's kid. We live in a three-bedroom house, the master suite, my brother's bedroom, and my bedroom. We also have a basement with a bathroom. When I found out my parents were pregnant, one of their first requests was that the baby share my room. I immediately declined because they wanted a newborn not to sleep in their room, but in mine, while I was finishing my last year of high school and preparing for college. I said no, and the baby should sleep in their room, and when it was old enough to have its own room, I will already have moved out. One of my friends is kinda rich, and her parents are gonna buy her an apartment for college, and she told me that I could stay there for cheap. They got really mad at me and told me how much stress they would have after having the baby. Now, I understand pregnancy is hard and all, but I really don't want to have to listen to a baby crying, have them run into my room when I'm sleeping, doing homework, etc. I told them that I thought it would be easier if the baby stayed in their room or if I moved to the basement, but that would be a little annoying as our basement isn't really room fit. Like, I don't know how to describe it, but I wouldn't want to live there. I understand I might be a little rude, because my parents won't have their baby till February. They're like two months pregnant or something. I don't know. They just said the due date is in February. But I feel like that's going to be an incredibly stressful time, even for just the four-ish months I'm staying here. You know, with the school ending, college entrance exams, waiting to see if I got in, etc. All the works. And on a more personal note, I can't stand babies. They weird me out. I'm thinking I could be in the wrong, because their room is more cluttered than mine, and they could have a problem making space. And my parents have their ideas, you know? So I could just be biased. So, am I in the wrong? Not the jerk. Babies cry a lot in the night, and it's not your responsibility. You will not be able to sleep the whole night if the baby moves into your room. Stressful for the actual parents to have their baby in their room, but it's fine if they make the daughter have the baby in their room? Wow. Not the jerk. It's their kid, and if they don't want to deal with a newborn baby crying at night, they shouldn't have had another baby not expect their daughter to do it for them. Also, how is your older brother your stepfather's kid? Did your mom and stepfather break up for a bit? Your mom had you, and then your mom and stepfather got back together? OP. My mother cheated on my father with my stepfather and then hid my brother from him for two years. And then when she was pregnant with me, she thought it was my stepfather's kid, so she broke up with my dad and married my stepfather, but then paternity test and all showed that I was my dad's kid. Am I the jerk for refusing to let my boyfriend have my bank account info to make a purchase? I, female 31, have been with my boyfriend, male 37, for 8 months. He has 3 kids and he's a single dad. We're on pretty good terms regarding almost everything. When it comes to money and spending, we take turns to invite each other out weekly. We don't live together, obviously. Several times, he had me pay for his kids' purchases. I didn't make a big issue out of it for the sole reason that these purchases were relatively small. All I had to pay was $30 to $60. The other day, he called me while I was at work and sounded like he was in a hurry. He said he just found the gaming device he's been looking for for so long and wanted to buy it for his oldest son. I asked, what's this have to do with me? And he told me he was short on money and needed $300. He asked me to lend him the $300 and I hesitated but agreed. He asked for my bank account info so he could pull the money, but I refused and told him to wait for me until I get there. He insisted and said he would handle it. All I had to do was just send him my bank account info after I end the call with him. His insistence made me uncomfortable, so I still said no and told him to either wait or I won't pay. He got mad at me, saying he didn't get why I was acting like this. He got so loud I had to hang up. I found him sitting outside after I got home. He was waiting for me and was extremely upset. He asked why I didn't just send him the account info so he could pull the money we agreed on. 
I told him I don't feel comfortable letting anyone have my personal info, especially when it comes to finances. He got offended and said, I'm not just anyone, I'm your partner, then went on a rant about how he ended up not buying the gaming device after looking for it for so long, and now his kid is mad at him and it's my fault. We had a fight, then he left, and told me I'd better have an apology for him and his son next time I call his phone. I haven't called yet, but I feel like I acted stupidly and irrationally. I think I should have just given him the info he asked for. I don't know if I made the right decision. Oh no. You've been with him for only 8 months and he's already demanding that you lend him money and give him your bank account info? Sounds to me like those small purchases he got you to do for his kid's stuff were his way of softening you up so he could later on request a big purchase and you'd be used to it, so wouldn't hesitate. You didn't act irrationally, he did. If he can't afford it, he needs to wait until he can. I wouldn't give my own mother my bank account details, and she wouldn't ask either, let alone a partner I've been with for less than a year. A year is where the honeymoon period starts to wear off, where the person starts revealing their true colors and all their flaws. If he's acting like this at 8 months, during the period where he's still showing you his best side, what's he going to be like in a year from now? What's he going to be demanding then? What's he going to be telling you that you need to buy right now? So again, no. He should be apologizing to you. He acted appallingly. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. This has red flags written all over it. The request to pay for his kids? Red flag. Demanding money? Red flag. The demand for your account info? Red flag. The anger when you told him no, demanding for an apology, the waiting outside your house, the gaslighting, only 8 months into the relationship asking for money. With Zelle, Venmo, etc., there's no need to give anyone your account info. Please do not do this. It's how people get all of their money stolen. You don't owe him anything. If you gave him the money, you may never see it again or the request will get bigger. $300 for a game is not an emergency. Rethink this relationship. It will only get worse. Dear Tyler, for context, I work at a pizzeria that uses a coal brick oven. It has to be stoked and sometimes mistakes happen. Your fiance made me cry. You're the first table that has actually made me cry in the seven months I've been serving. Albeit I'm exhausted from the summertime tourism rush and all the doubles. But when you sat down, I literally told you it was going to take about an hour for your food to get out because the oven was colder than usual and our kitchen was working their tails off but they couldn't compensate for the floor load in addition to the oven temp. I thanked you for letting me know that you were seeing a movie after dinner because that let me know how I should serve you. When about 45 minutes passed and your fiancé started being rude to me, I apologized. You claimed to have been there longer than you were. Y'all do know we can look at the computer to see the seating times, right? When you decided to walk out, I don't know what you said to my manager, but he also almost cried and I've never seen him like that before. You hogged my table for an hour after coming in pretending the wait time was okay with you and tipped me zero dollars when somebody else could have been sitting at that table enjoying themselves. You left such an impression on me that I remembered enough details about you to find you on Facebook in two seconds. Let me just say, your and your fiancé's memes and posts about respect and likability do not reflect on your behavior last night. You never know who you're going to interact with and you're lucky I'm a civilized human being who's going to leave it at an anonymous Reddit post. Just be aware of your presence and behavior in this world going forward. I could have been a monster. I hope you're ashamed. I'm exhausted and giving everybody my 100% even when I'm only at 20% capacity. Fellow coal brick oven pizzeria employee here. Stoking is essential, but most guests do not understand. Most of our bad reviews on Yelp are people who come in during stoking and told pizzas will take about an hour and then leave a review saying we turn them away because we shut down our ovens, wondering why we would do that in the middle of the day. Our hosts are trained to let everyone who walks through the door during stoke know what the stoking process is and how long it will take. Some guests decide they don't want to wait and leave. Fine, cool. That's why we let you know so that you can make that decision. However, some guests decide to sit down anyway after being warned about stoking. That's when I come up. Hi folks, welcome. Did the host let you know about stoking? Them every time. No, what's that? I feel your pain and these people suck. They most likely weren't paying attention when they were told about stoking and then they got upset when they finally realized what was going on. The stoking process takes time and has to be done. It consists of knocking down any old coal and ash inside our ovens. We then rebuild the fire, clean and reset. Next, the oven is reheated to the perfect temperature to craft amazing pizzas. 
Am I the jerk for not tattooing my stepson's name on my arm with my kids' names? I'm 36, male. My wife is 35. I have two kids from my first marriage who are 9 and 7. I've been married to my wife for 4 years. We have a 1-year-old together. She has an 8-year-old son from her first marriage. The kids all live with us. My kid's mother has visitation one weekend a month. Her son's dad isn't involved at all. I have the names of my oldest two kids tattooed on my arm. I just recently added the name of my youngest daughter. My wife and I were talking about the tattoo and she asked me if I'll tattoo my stepson's name in the same round as our daughter's. I told her I have no intention of tattooing his name. She was shocked and asked me why. I said I only have the names of my kids tattooed. She said I am excluding her son and he's part of this family too. I refused to tattoo his name and proceeded to only tattoo my daughter's name. Wife called me all sorts of things. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. You've been a father figure to him for half his life. The poor kid will probably be shattered when he realizes you don't actually see him as yours. 1000 times this. The kid looks up to you as a father. He's going to be so hurt when he realizes you don't feel the same way. If OP hasn't adopted the kid, then he has no rights if they divorce. Tattooing a stepkid's name is not the same as tattooing a biological kid's name. You're the jerk. Look, no one gets to dictate what you put on your body, but you made it incredibly clear to your stepson where he stands in this family, on the outside. And right now, he's eight, and he's not going to notice. But when he gets older, he will, and you're going to have to tell him why. You have also sent a clear message to your wife where her kid stands in this family. Don't get upset when she makes sure to prioritize your stepson over your older kids because you made it clear the dynamics you expected. So what happens when and if they divorce? Dude is just going to have his ex's kid's name tattooed on him? He's not the jerk. People are asking for too much from him. Like, of course he's going to favor his biological kids more than his stepkids. Maybe later down the road if he stays in the relationship and raises the kid, then it would make sense. But right now, no. I think definitely not the jerk. And I say this because I've known people that did get their stepkids names tattooed on them. Guess what happened? The marriage didn't work out and the actual parents refused any contact for the stepkids. Not saying that this will happen to OP, but for me this is the equivalent of tattooing your significant other's name on you. You just don't do it. I will say that a nice alternative is to make the stepson feel included would be to get a tattoo that doesn't have his name but represents him somehow. Then he's included without having his name and it's different from the others, so it would be even more special. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I've been thinking about getting a teardrop tattoo myself. Skrr, skrr. Karen girlfriend controls which friends I can hang out with. So kind of a weird situation. I, 26 male, have an awesome girlfriend, Kendall, who's also 26. We've been together for three years and I plan to marry her. We have a great friend group that includes a lot of my high school friends and their girlfriends. We typically meet up twice a week and I live for these hangouts. Kendall has some social anxiety, so sometimes it isn't the easiest getting her out of her shell. But for the most part, she really does try and my friends love her. So the whole situation revolves around my good friend Mandy, who's 26. Me and Mandy were friends since high school and went to the same college and became best friends. She is a main character in our friend group. At first, Mandy and Kendall were great friends. But one night, Mandy joked with Kendall that they were Eskimo sisters. Kendall asked what she meant by that. The truth being that one night five years ago while in college, me and Mandy hooked up at a party. We hardly even remember this and think it's literally hilarious now. We make jokes about it. When Kendall found out, she had a panic attack and we had to leave. We talked it over and I said that I didn't feel like it was really all that relevant. We're just friends now. Kendall said she was fine and thought that it was just shocking. I reassured her that it was a drunken night five years ago and it meant nothing. Ever since, it's been a pattern. We will go out with my friends, Kendall will see Mandy, panic attack ensues and we have to leave. It has happened five or six times now, to the point where my friends ask why we just leave randomly. Kendall isn't a jealous person at all. She's very confident in herself and never displays jealous tendencies. But for some reason, when she sees Mandy, she breaks into a panic attack. But she keeps wanting to hang out with the friend group and prove it doesn't bother her, so she keeps wanting to hang out. But when she does, panic attack, then we leave. So I've gotten tired of this. I want to see my friends. So we had a trivia night recently and I told Kendall that I was hanging out with my work friends, not my high school friend group. She said she would hang out at home then. So me and a coworker met up with my friend group and we did a trivia night. 
unfortunately, one of my friends put up a story of all of us and Kendall saw. When I got home, she was furious that I excluded her from a friend group hangout. I said that I felt like she was isolating me from my friends with her issues and I wanted to see them for a full night, not 30 minutes. She said she can't control her panic attacks, but she is working on them and me excluding her because of them was a jerk move. Am I the jerk? Hold on, I have another question. Why the heck did Mandy all of a sudden bring up this joke after you've been with your girlfriend for three years and I'm assuming having these hangouts the majority of that time? Suspect. So why did Mandy feel the need to tell your girlfriend about a drunken night from five years ago if it meant nothing to the both of you? You're the jerk, but especially Mandy. Not the jerk. Look, anytime a guy on Reddit expresses concern about his girlfriend and her guy friends or ex-boyfriends, Everyone here calls him insecure, red flags, and that she should leave. It's just one of the double standards we see here every day. So let me get some malicious compliance here, bro. It sounds like your current girlfriend really does love you and care about you, so I'd stay with her if possible. But with Mandy, it sounds like she may still have a thing for you. If I were in your shoes, I'd definitely try to double dip if you catch my drift. Only losers let opportunities like this pass you by. But if you don't take the cake, another Chad will. So why not you? Let's be honest here. Do you really think things will work out long term with someone so insecure? Who you have to lie to about who you're hanging out with? Just have fun, bro. That's the meaning of life. And it sounds like you've got the opportunity for sure. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. I think that last commenter was the biggest jerk of them all, to be honest. You must clock out at 1.30 a.m. Okay. Hi, first time poster, long time lurker. Also, English is not my first language and I'm on mobile. This story happened today, literally an hour ago. It's not the biggest malicious compliance ever, but I'm kind of an anxious doormat and I'm proud of myself. So some background. I, 28 female, work a part-time job in a well-known fast food chain. Dear American readers, I live in Europe. If something doesn't make sense to you, you know why. While I try to finish my master's degree. I usually work evenings and nights and close the cafe area from one to three times a week. The cafe takes a lot of time to close as one, it's a lot of work per se. Dishes to wash, machines to clean up, refrigerated counter to clean and stock, etc. Two, my coworkers usually leave a mess and don't really clean up after themselves. And three, I also have to work the front and we've been painstakingly understaffed for months. So it's quite common for me to stay another 20 to 30 minutes after my shift is over even more time if needed. I take pride in doing my job and I hate leaving a mess for the opening shift to deal with. Some of them are my friends and I generally respect the vast majority of my workers. Things started to go south some months ago. We are understaffed and being asked to work longer shifts and overtime for the well-being of the company. Yeah, they really said that. Sometimes it happens that someone has to work more than 10 hour long shifts because no one can cover their role slash we have a sudden influx of clients. It's illegal by the way. To avoid paying us more, they're using in a not very legal way our paid leaves and vacation days. Not illegal either, it's more of a gray area, but they're not supposed to do it the way that they are doing it. Week schedule is put out with just one half day's notice. We are not allowed to ask for weekends and looks like they're mobbing some coworkers in order for them to leave. Onto the story. As I've said, I really like my coworkers and I need money. So I was kind of fine working more hours and keeping up with maintenance and extraordinary cleaning. This pace has been damaging my mental and physical health. I have a couple of conditions that are not in check anymore. Moreover, I've always thought that the store manager and I were kind of friendly. Until Sunday, when I've learned from a manager that this gentleman wrote in the manager's WA group that people closing the cafe are not supposed to stay after the end of their shift and if they can't close properly, they need to quickly wipe with a cloth in the last 30 minutes. Needless to say, he was talking about me and another colleague, the only ones left who can actually close the cafe and clean it enough to be in line with company policies, as we are the ones that usually stay late to properly do our jobs. The other girl that takes ages and does a poor job and is kind of a snitch was completely ignored. I have GAD and MDD. I still rely a lot on my performance to evaluate my worth. Let's say I didn't take it kindly. I felt hurt and I've spent the last few days thinking about it. Tonight, closing shift. Me. So, store manager said that I have to leave at 1.30 a.m., right? Shift manager. Yup. Me. 
I'm not required to do the extra stuff no one else will do. Shift manager. Still don't get why you're doing it in the first place. But no, you are not. Just clean it up enough to not look like a landfill and stock the counter. Me. Basic cleaning and resupplying? Yep. Me. Copy that. The shift runs smoothly. Few clients now and then. No need to rush. At 12.45 a.m., the cafe is in okay conditions. It will probably pass a health inspection, but we are far from corporate standards. They dictated even how sugar should be displayed, or my usual closing ones. At 1.10 a.m., I enter the office and sit down, scrolling on my phone. Shift manager. What's up? Me. I'm done. You can go home. You don't need to stay. Me. It's 1.10 a.m. So? So he said 1.30 a.m. I've got another 20 minutes left on my shift. I mean, he didn't say that we can leave early and save the company some money. He said I need to leave at 1.30 a.m. Shift manager. Know what? I'd really like some company. And after all, he said 1.30 a.m. He's the store manager. I'm not supposed to contradict him. I clocked out at 1.30 a.m. as requested. Is something going to change? I don't think so. I don't think they really care enough to notice, not during their power struggle and whatnot. Maybe, just maybe, they will realize something is wrong and try to change it, but I wouldn't bet on that. More likely, we're going to have a new store manager, the fifth one in less than a year and a half. But it feels good being paid for scrolling Reddit and smoking instead of keeping up with the extraordinary maintenance the management can't bother to do or require the closing staff to do and being unappreciated. After all, I was required to clock out at 1.30 a.m. Edit. I wanted to thank you for all the attention I received. I didn't expect it. Compared to other posts, it's a lame story and the useful advice. As I've said, I don't think we're going to have a real fallout in the short term. The situation is complex. My first little malicious compliance is just a small drop in the ocean. But if something happens or changes, I'll update you. For everyone concerned about my health, I'm taking steps to take care of it. I've started working less and saying no when asked to come in during my days off or every single time some colleague can't show up for their shift. Rest assured, my top priority is my master's degree. Am I the jerk for throwing away the food my wife put in the freezer? I, 39 male, have been married to my wife, who's 32, for four years. We usually get along just fine. One of the issues that we've had since our relationship began has been about our freezer. Simply put, my wife stuffs the freezer full of food constantly. There is absolutely zero space for me to put anything in there. At first, I tried to solve this by buying the fridge with the biggest freezer we could find. I dropped nearly four grand on it. She interpreted this as an invitation to buy more frozen food so she could play microwave dinner Tetris with the freezer. Every single nook and cranny is stuffed full. She still buys frozen foods and somehow finds a way to fit them in. The worst part is when I buy a frozen pizza or freeze something for meal prep. She asks me at least three to four times a day when I'm going to take it out of the freezer. She essentially nags me until I remove the food from the freezer so she can put something she won't be touching for six months in its place. Last weekend, I finally snapped and bought an inexpensive single-door deep freezer. I put it in the basement near the washer and dryer and put a couple of my own things in there, mostly some frozen veggies and a few burritos. I didn't really mention it to my wife because she wasn't home when I brought it in. When my wife got home later in the day, she went downstairs to do laundry and discovered my freezer. She excitedly ran upstairs to tell me that the upstairs one is full and she can actually fit more food in there now. I responded that under no circumstances is she to touch the freezer because it's mine. Not a single ice cube should be put in there. Then I told her to not even ask because I knew she had mentioned three to four times a day that she needs more freezer room. She sulked and tried to debate the issue, but I was able to placate her. A couple of days later, I went down to the basement to get something from my freezer and there I found it about 70% full of microwave dinners. Upon checking the freezer in the kitchen, I found that it too was still completely full. I calmly went downstairs with a large garbage bag, threw everything into it, and then tossed it into our trash bin. Then I found a padlock I had lying around and locked it up with a chain. Later that day, my wife brought more frozen food to put into the new freezer, but when she got downstairs, she noticed the lock and flipped her lid. She told me I was being controlling, when I told her there's no way she will ever use that freezer again, she threw something like a tantrum and left for her mom's house. She came back later that day and told me I had 24 hours to unlock the freezer. Nothing really happened after those 24 hours, but now she's completely ignoring everything I say. I think my actions were justifiable, but was I wrong here?
Not the jerk. But the bigger issue is what is behind this? Is this restricted to the freezer or is she controlling and or a hoarder in general? Either way, she's not being rational. Ask her at what point, at how many freezers would she stop and think it's okay for you to have your own freezer space that she can't use? How many months of frozen food does she actually need? Can she tell you how long it will take her to get through what she already has? What was her thought process when she bought more to put in the new freezer? Was it that she needed the food or that she needed to fill the space? You're unlikely to get rational answers to these questions, but asking them might open a space in her mind where she can see, even a little, that she's being irrational and needs to deal with her issues. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I've got a solution. Give some of those microwave dinners to me. Any Salisbury steak ones? Am I the jerk for bringing eggs to a vegan wedding? I realize from the title I probably immediately sound like the jerk, but hear me out. So my, 21 female, brother, who's 26, got married last weekend. He and my new sister-in-law, who's 26, had known each other for a few years now, and naturally, I was invited to the wedding. She had been vegan since she was 12 and had also converted my brother in recent years, so they decided to make the wedding vegan. Basically, this meant that all the catering was vegan food, even the alcohol, and they used petals from their garden instead of plastic confetti and things like that to make the wedding as eco-friendly as possible. I have no problem with any of this, and I think it's great. Anyway, the problem is this. The issue I often have with eating anything anywhere is that I have multiple allergies, peanuts, soy, sesame, and a mild shellfish allergy as well. The first three I named are very serious and have landed me in the hospital in the past because of cross-contamination, so I'm really weary. I talked to my brother about if there would be anything safe for me to eat at the event, but because they're using a local neighborhood lady's business as the catering service instead of something professional, I did not feel comfortable enough that there was absolutely zero chance of me having a reaction, especially because the allergies were ingredients in many of the dishes. It felt too risky, so I said I'd bring my own food, and he agreed that that was the best option. I've done this with plenty of such events in the past, and it's never been a problem. The wedding day arrives, and it comes time to eat. Everyone is digging into the food, and I pull out my Tupperware quite happily, and I dig in when I see the bride staring at me with horror on her face. I had bought a homemade sort of salad box, which had two eggs on top, and she literally just stared at me in disgust the entire time we ate without saying anything. After the meal's finished, she pulled me to the side and said I ruined her meal and her appetite and ruined her day and that I'm clearly a selfish person because I can't even go one meal without animal secretions in a vegan wedding and that it was seriously disrespectful because the fact that it was a vegan wedding was the main focus. In my eyes, I brought my own food because they weren't able to provide me with something which was safe to eat and it's not like I brought in a steak. I had two eggs and a big salad and she must have been specifically staring at my food to even realize they were there. However, I'm beginning to wonder if I'm the jerk because my brother also said it was in poor taste and I should have brought something else. So what are your thoughts? Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. While I understand having dietary restrictions and it being her day, you have unavoidable dietary restrictions in that you are severely allergic to some foods, some of which were listed in the ingredients. You talked it out and got permission to bring your own food. You did your due diligence. From there, it's the responsibility of your brother to mention to his new wife what is going on. Not the jerk, not remotely. Sorry, but the focus of her wedding was veganism? Not that she was making a commitment to the person she loves? She's a jerk for that comment alone. But you're not the jerk. If they were unable to cater for you, they have no right to take offense of what you made yourself. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister-in-law? Please let us know. I'm still trying to figure out why anyone would go to a wedding which theme is veganism. You demanded my entire team be at the office for the 4th of July. Fine, enjoy paying for the office party. So this starts on Monday the 13th, as I receive an email from a VP, not over my department, or bad VP. I'm told that my team will be required on the 4th. I politely tell them that our team had been scheduled this day off and people already have plans. My team is the IT team. And as many of you know, IT teams always get done over. So over the course of the week, I let my team know what is happening. I let them know I've been reaching out to higher ups to fix it. I also tell them that if their plans are ruined, I will make it right at work. Over the course of three meetings, it starts to look like things will not go my way. In response, I send an email to the CEO of the company. All of my higher ups know I was going to do this and said I should do this as he is very family oriented 
and that he would not allow anyone to work on a national holiday. Well, he's on vacation in the Bahamas until the 6th, but his assistant informed me that he would look at this after he gets back, repeatedly slams head into desk. So I tell everyone that it will be work from home and that we will be setting my cell phone as priority in the call routing, meaning I would get most of the calls. To be honest, I was expecting almost zero calls, especially since I was asked to send out a notification that IT support would cover the 4th of July. I never sent that email out. A day later, I was given another outrage. I was told in an email that my employees would be required to be at the office and no one was allowed to work from home. They would be checking the door badge ins to verify we were at the office. I asked why in an email and they said that they wanted to make sure no one was playing video games at work. We normally would work from home about two third of the week and video game playing is a normal occurrence at work. So I walked into the person's office. After a very long conversation where she was losing the logic war with me, she told me that, it's just IT, you guys don't have lives. No, I'm not kidding you. This is exactly what they told me. I reported this to my VP who said, I will take care of this. It likely won't be until after the fourth, so get creative. I know this man well. We've worked together a long time and get creative is code for corporate malicious compliance. I asked the person requiring us to be at the office if they cared if we had an office party. They said no, as long as it did not interfere with the call flow. Even suggested using my new company card to pay for it. Go wild. Pro tip, never tell me go wild. At this point, it was Tuesday the 21st. I let everyone know what's up, but that I have something planned. I asked who had things planned for that day. Two people told me they were planning to shoot off fireworks with their family, but the rest were planning barbecues with friends. I write up an email to the VP over my department and the bad VP. I tell them all that I let everyone know. We were all expected to work until 8 p.m. Monday. Per the conversation with the bad VP, I will be having an office party as a sort of sorry to the guys and gals who got done over by this decision. The bad VP replied again. Thank you for all understanding. Also, yes, I would expect an office party if I had to work on the 4th of July as well. So go wild and enjoy your time. Use your new company credit card if you need to cover a few expenses. Also, I should not have to remind you or anyone else. No fireworks or alcohol on company property. So now it's time to tell you about my office. See, a while back, the IT team was moved from the main corporate office and into a smaller building by itself. It has a nice gaming break room a decent sized gym and a full on drink bar. Soft drinks, mind you, no alcohol at work. Out back is a big patio that crosses county lines as soon as you cross a small creek, a creek that just so happens to have a footbridge over it leading to an empty field. I start making phone calls. Monday, June 25th. I call up everyone into an hour early meeting that morning. I explain to them all that I will be making it right. I asked everyone to invite their friends and family to the office. No supplies will need to be brought by anyone. I tell them all that this will be non-alcoholic, but that I will be planning something for everyone. I told them to expect all food to be provided and they don't need to bring anything unless they want to bring some fireworks, i.e. they won't have to spend a dime. The fourth comes and the entire day we did absolutely no work. No tickets, no calls came in. Well, seven calls did come in, but from the same person, the bad VP. She was calling to make sure we were manning the phones. All of us were playing video games or watching movies. 6 p.m. rolls around and everyone was told that the food was ready. People were expecting hot dogs, hamburgers, maybe a bratwurst or two. What they got was a full-on barbecue feast with pizza and other foods. There was smoked brisket, spare ribs, smoked sausage, smoked turkey, both kinds of tater salad, coleslaw, green beans, and bacon and onion, potatoes all gratin, pizza from two different places, excellent hamburgers and bratwurst hot dogs. On the dessert side was cake, very good cookies, four different kinds of pies, and about two pounds of fudge. Families and friends started showing up at around 6 to 6.15ish. Some brought alcohol, but I told them they would need to leave that in their cars, as I was not that crazy. Some were not too happy about that, but agreed as it was a free dinner for random strangers. So, let me set the scene for you. I'm out there with all calls routed to my cell phone, and everyone just having a good time. We have a ton of people there just enjoying the fun night, chatting about random stuff, eating the food, and occasionally lighting off some sparklers or throwing firecrackers into the stream. It's not stocked and only one foot deep. My VP, not the bad VP mind you, showed up with his family and brought some water balloons for the kids. 
and man-children. Around 8.30ish it gets dark and people want to shoot off more than the simple sparklers and firecrackers we'd been using. The VP over the IT department had everyone cross the footbridge over the county line and off company property mind you and we set up a big wooden board using it as our launch pad. We fired off what we had for an hour or two and sort of just hung out for a little while. At around this time, people were tired and ready to head home. I told people to take home leftovers, within reason. We all clocked out at 8 and no one left until about 10.30. The bad VP did call once more while we were out back at the party. It was 7.50 and she called asking for a status update. My exact words were, Well, you were the only one to call us today. The rest of us are on the back patio enjoying the 4th of July shindig. She simply acted like my boss and said, As long as no alcohol or fireworks are on company property, I do not care. We ate roughly half of the food catered. The rest was taken home. A small group volunteered to stay behind to clean up, including my VP. We had a fun conversation about how this will make waves with the bosses, but he said he had my back and asked me how much this cost. I just gave him a sideways look, which made him laugh. Tuesday morning, I submitted the expense report to my VP. This email would inevitably make its way over to the bad VP and up the chain to the CIO of the company. It would be a bad idea to give out the exact cost of the party, mind you, but I can tell you that because of this 4th of July party, new rules were put into place. Any expenses of over $4,000 or more must be approved by the direct supervisor, VP over the department, and the full expense report must be sent to the financial department for review after the fact. Hint, the party cost over $6,000. The barbecue was the most expensive part. I did not order from a low or mid-tier place. The place I ordered from has consistently been on the top 10 in the DFW listing for the last 30 years. I ate at that place so much, I made friends with the owner. The best barbecue I have ever had. The pies and cakes were custom made by a bakery and the cookies were made by a boutique cookie place. I had 10 12 packs of Coke, Coke Zero, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper Zero, Pepsi and Pepsi Zero. I bought 5 pepperoni, 5 sausage, 5 cheese, 2 Hawaiian and 3 cheeseburger pizzas from one place and nearly the same number from another place. Excluding the cheeseburger ones, I subbed out those for a different specialty pizza from the other place. The burgers were from an excellent burger place that did catering. I know the owner well. He brought his kids for the night of fun after he heard what was going to be happening. He also was the one who brought the brat dogs as he had recently added those to his menu. This was the most expensive office party in the history of the company. The only things more expensive than this were some business meetings that the CEO rented private rooms and high-end restaurants for. As for the CEO, he was outraged. Not at the cost of the party, mind you. He knew that the party would not have been necessary if people had been allowed to go home. He was outraged that IT was the only group required to work on that day. When I submitted the logs showing how we received no real phone calls, no service requests, and that we basically watched movies and played video games during our shift, he had heard enough. He apparently sent out a scathing email about work-life balance and the importance of our holidays to every upper management. It was kind of funny as people wanted me to get in trouble for what I did, but the reality is other departments have done similar things in the past, just not on the scale that IT did. The bad VP was admonished quite effectively and sent me an apology email. I forwarded it to the team with a strong hint to not reply. Then my VP let the CIO and CEO know about what the bad VP said. You guys don't have lives. The bad VP did actually confirm she said it in a meeting with her EVP. It did not go over well. I've never heard people yelling in an office meeting like that before. The CEO of the company came to our office and yelled at her. Not sure if she was fired, but she's not at work today. Not 100% sure what happened to her. I know she lost whatever clout she had at this company with her attitude. If anything else happens, I'll update. But so far, it looks like the fallout from this is... I caused a new rule to be put into place about how much you're allowed to spend at one time. The bad VP may or may not be let go or forced to resign. I know she got yelled at. Strangely, there's now no longer any pushback for my bid to get everyone back to working from home. Am I the jerk for being upset that my wife wants me to use all my vacation time for her family events? My wife, 35 female, and I, 37 male, have been married for 10 years and have two kids who are 8 and 5. Last year, my wife was offered a pretty big promotion at her job. It's a huge step up and a big boost to her career goals, but it would require a relocation. After talking it over, we decided she should take it. We moved about six months ago. 
I was able to get a new job in our new city, but I only get 10 vacation days for the first year. Part of my wife's promotion was that she got a lot more vacation days. She has five weeks. She's already used a couple of weeks of her vacation time for trips with her friends or sisters. I've stayed home with the kids while she's on these trips. She also took the kids on a trip while I stayed at home. She still has over two weeks of vacation time left. We've started discussing our holiday plans for this coming winter and she wants to go visit her parents for an extended visit. She wants to take time off around Christmas and New Year's and stay with them for two weeks. That's all well and good, but that's pretty much all of my vacation time. I told her that I don't want to use all of my vacation time just to go and see her family. I said I would be okay with using five days or so, but I want to save some time for me to use for things I want to do, like she did. She got upset because she wants us all to be together for the holidays, and since the kids have all that time off school anyway, it makes sense to her that we would stay for a long time. We also haven't seen her parents since we moved, so I get why she wants to stay that long. I tried offering that she can stay for as long as she wants with the kids and I would head home by myself early, but that wasn't acceptable because she doesn't want to fly with both kids by herself, which I understand, but I'm just trying to compromise. She wants to start booking flights and I'm not willing to use all my vacation time for one trip to see her family. We got into a fight over it because she's not willing to accept my compromises. I finally got mad at her and told her that she got to use as much time as she wanted to do fun things for herself while I watched the kids, and I want to be able to do the same. I told her that it's great that she has so many new benefits from her new job, but I had to start over and I don't have those same options. She took that as me being resentful for moving, which isn't true. I'm happy she got promoted and I'm not mad about relocating, but I am upset that she isn't willing to understand that my work circumstances are drastically different from hers now. I'm not willing to budge on this and she's mad at me that I'm not simply going along with what she wants to do. I know it's important that she sees her family, but I just want the option to do fun things for myself like she did. She thinks I'm being petty and stubborn because I'm jealous of her promotion. Not the jerk. I don't see anything wrong with your compromise and she's not willing to compromise at all by the sounds of it. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. She needs to learn what compromise means. No kids menu? I work in a brewery. The sign above the door states the name of the brewery. The sign on the glass part of the doors that has our hours states the name of the brewery. The giant metal sign that hangs behind the bar, name of the brewery. We open at noon on Sundays. That's usually my shift and I love it. It's a slow, easy open because we don't have a kitchen or spirits or table service. I leave the door open when I get there because our walk-in is outside and I have to restock the cooler with packaged drinks, sodas, and our small selection of snack foods. Allow me to set the scene. The lights are all off, the music is absolutely ear-bleedingly loud, and I'm counting the drawer. Lady walks in 30 minutes before we open with two kids. I'd guess they were around four years old. She is furious. This music is entirely too loud and not appropriate for my girls. I'd agree. It will be at an appropriate level and on a different station when we open at noon. Can't you do that now? You know what? Fine, I can. So I do, and I go back to counting the drawer. Excuse me? Where should we sit? Anywhere you'd like, ma'am, but I'm afraid I still have to finish opening and won't be able to get to y'all for at least 15 to 20 minutes. Is there no one else here? At this point, I make a very obviously snarky look around before I answered. Sure doesn't look like it. Fine, just give me a coffee and two milks. Ma'am, this is a brewery. I don't have any of that. Fine. Just let me see the menu and I'll decide. I point to the draft board and tell her that those are the draft selections, the chalkboard next to it with our wine selections and snacks, and I tell her we have Coke, Diet Coke, and Sprite in cans. My kids aren't allowed sugary soft drinks. Where's the kids menu? We want breakfast. Ma'am, this is a brewery. We don't have kids menus, milk, juice, or breakfast foods. The whole time that she had ignored every obvious clue and sign and thought that she was at a breakfast spot around the corner, which isn't even open on Sunday. Edit. Since many of you asked about why the breakfast place isn't open on Sunday, I asked one of my coworkers last night. It turns out that during lockdown, they had so many issues with people ignoring the protocols about seating and spacing with the church crowd on Sunday that they just closed to avoid the issue, and decided they liked being closed on Sunday so much that they never reopened. 
My Karen mother-in-law demands my leftovers, so I called her a freeloader. For context, I was raised that whenever you go to someone's house for an event, like a cookout or a holiday party, etc., you should always bring something such as a side or a dessert or a bottle of wine for the hosts. If there are leftovers, they now belong to the hosts and they can do whatever they want with them. Say it's your job to bring soda to a barbecue, any leftover soda is now for the host. My husband's family expects me to host every holiday party and cookout and foot the bill too. So I'm usually hosting for 15 to 20 plus people. For Christmas, I had to buy a $100 ham and then make all the sides, desserts, provide the drinks, utensils, etc. My mother-in-law and most of her family would always show up empty-handed with their own to-go containers and never lift a finger to help prepare or clean up. I am the mother of three kids and I work a full-time job and it's the kind of job where I work holidays and weekends. Money started getting tight with all the inflation and I'm just beyond exhausted. So I've been asking for everyone to either bring a side or dessert or drinks and I will provide the main dish as well as all the utensils, etc. to help with our budget and to save me some time. This last cookout we had, I supplied the main dishes and a side. My mother-in-law begrudgingly brought a watermelon and her famous to-go containers. As I was cleaning up, she made sure to grab the remainder of my watermelon and then started to fill her containers with our leftovers. When I asked her politely to please not take it because it was my kid's favorite and they will be having it for lunch tomorrow, she implied that I was rude and inconsiderate. I lost it and called her a freeloader and said she's welcome to host and provide for everyone at the next cookout then. So am I the jerk? Info. Why do you continue to host these gatherings that you clearly hate hosting and are full of resentment about? Because her husband can't say no to mommy, I would bet my money on it. If I were OP, I would come down with something just before or the day of the next big get together so she doesn't have to be around food. If the husband can't say no to his family, let's see him do all the work. Let him take on an extra part-time job is more like it. I'm normally all for being a generous host but in this case, I would not provide anything but cheap hot dogs and buns, tap water, and paper plates. Let everyone sign up for a dish on a spreadsheet and then see what happens. Or even better, if they just serve a big vat of baked beans and nothing else. That will put a stop to guests bringing only watermelon. Do lock up your fridge and pantry though for this social experiment. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or everybody else? Please let us know. I'd sneak a little something special in their food but I'm evil. Am I the jerk for the strict summer schedule I have my kids on? It's summertime, so while mom and I work, our three kids are at home, ages between 8 to 15. We were talking with other parents about what our kids do during the day, and some friends were shocked that I was being so strict during summer break. Here's why. They have to do chores every day. Chores include daily, cleaning the bathroom, the bedrooms, playroom, and any dishes, basically picking up after themselves. Monday, Wash, fold, put up their laundry. Tuesday, sweep and vacuum. Wednesday, mow and weed eat the lawn. Thursday, nothing extra. Friday, sweep and vacuum. Monday through Friday, they wake up and run one mile and have 15 minutes to do it. If they don't make it in 15 minutes, nothing happens. I'm just giving them a very achievable goal. Electronics are turned off at 12.30 until we get home from work around 4.30. We have a pool and they have so many toys. They have things to do that don't include electronics. They have to complete the chores by 4.30, so they spend the morning playing Xbox or watching TV, eating lunch. They then do chores and entertain themselves. I don't want my kids just sitting in front of a screen all day because it's not healthy. Being forced to use your imagination isn't a bad thing as far as I'm concerned. I want them to run because they all play sports and they get gassed out rather quickly. This is the first summer we've done the mile thing and I'm hoping it helps once fall sports start. I'm just trying to equip my kids the best way I know how. Other parents have made comments about how summer break is all about relaxing and getting to take a break from responsibilities. All fun. I felt conflicted, so am I the jerk? Edit. This was the exact response I expected. I showed my kids this thread too. They said they spend 30 minutes on chores most days and 15 minutes running. The 15-year-old relaxes most of the day and said the only time he feels like a parent is when the younger two fight and he has to break them up. 90% of the day is spent playing and 10% is work. They don't swim unless they're all together. They are literally learning to clean up after themselves. If they make a mess, it's cleaned up. 
I'm glad so many of you are in the financial situation to afford nannies, summer camps, daycare, etc. But that ain't us. We work together. When mom and dad are home, we do chores too. And on weekends, we all play together. Sorry, but are you running an army unit or a family? And you're leaving them all home alone? This is horribly unfair to your 15-year-old. You can equip them by not forcing them to be in charge of each other, providing supervision in the form of summer activities, and allow them to be kids. You're the jerk. Edit. I just noticed your comment about the pool. You're leaving the 15-year-old in charge of everyone else and suggesting that they go swimming? Someone should call the authorities, and maybe it will be your 15-year-old. You're the jerk. Running a mile every weekday morning and the youngest is eight? I get the picking up after themselves, but wow, this is a little extreme. You're the jerk. Because you're making your 15-year-old manage the house alone for eight plus hours a day. First of all, that's too much. If they need exercise, put them in a summer sports program. A forced run first thing in the morning sounds miserable, like the worst gym class ever. Yikes. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Let me get this straight. You're raising your kids to have a strict set of values? To be responsible and healthy and happy? You should have known the people on Reddit weren't going to like this. Your kids are going to grow up to be pretty much the opposite of them. I'm paying for the room, so I can scream in there if I want. A few weeks ago, I was working one of my night audits during the week. At my hotel, the weekdays are normally calm as it's only workers staying with us, so they're sleeping all night. We'll occasionally get some night owls, but now that it's summer, we're getting more interesting people at the hotel. And oh boy, it's annoying. Roughly around 12.30 to 1 a.m., I get a call at the front desk from one of the rooms. Guest. I'm on the third floor, and something is going on across the hall. Sounds like someone fighting. Me. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I'll go check it out. I walk upstairs and immediately could tell where it was coming from. I walk up to the door, and it sounds like an all-out war is happening right in the room. Bunch of inaudible yelling. I knock on the door loud enough so they could hear. A woman swings the door open quite aggressively. Me. Hey, we're starting to get some noise complaints. I need you to... She cuts me off. I'm trying to get my daughter out of the bathroom. She locked herself in there. <laughs> Me. Okay, well, that's not my concern. I just need you to stop yelling because we're getting noise complaints. Guest directed at her daughter. Get out of there. We're getting in trouble now. Me. Ma'am, I really need you to stop yelling. Well... Can you get my daughter out of the bathroom? Me. Like I said, whatever's happening between you and your family is not my concern. I just need you to quiet down. Her daughter comes out of the bathroom in tears as I'm standing in the hallway and the mom finally stops yelling, so I go back to the front desk. Five minutes later, the mother leaves the hotel and I can hear yet another screaming match in the parking lot. The yelling was echoing everywhere because they were so loud, this time between her and the husband. I didn't say anything because I'd rather them argue in the parking lot than the hotel. They both come storming in the lobby and aggressively stomp up the stairs. I swear, the stairs sounded like they were going to cave in. Mind you, it's now close to 1.30 a.m., so the hotel is very quiet besides them. Another five minutes pass and I hear the arguing start up again. I try calling their rooms, but of course they didn't answer. So I walk up to the room, knock on the door, and they answer. I try telling them to quiet down and they're causing issues for the hotel. They try explaining their family drama to me, thinking I could resolve it. They kept going on about, Well, can you get my daughter to listen? Can you get my husband to stop yelling at me? I'm a front desk agent, not Dr. Phil. After they finally quiet down, I get back to the front desk to watch Netflix. Around 2.30 a.m. after running my reports, the mother comes by the front desk surprisingly calm at this point, asking for a new key card. I give her a new card, and this conversation is what annoyed me the most. Me. Here's the new key. By the way, if I hear more screaming or yelling, the police will be contacted. I'm not going to remind you all night. Guest. Excuse me? I'm paying for the room, so I can scream in there if I want. It's not your business. Me. It is my business, because you're disrupting the hotel. So like I said, if I hear screaming one more time, the police will be contacted. The guest just angrily walked away and I didn't hear anything from them the rest of the night. Don't get me wrong, I understand stuff happens and families will argue, but don't ask hotel staff to fix your personal issues and then get mad when you're told the police will be contacted because you're so loud. Your actions have consequences. Welcome to life. Am I the jerk for not letting my sister announce her pregnancy at my wedding? 
Me, 28, and my sister, 32, have never really gotten along that well. My parents were divorced, and so we never really spent much time together during our childhood. Once we got in our early 20s, though, that changed, and we actually got pretty close. Both of us were in serious relationships, and we would always talk about our dream weddings. Fast forward a few years, and my sister was finally getting married to her high school sweetheart. I've never seen her so happy, and I knew this was going to be one of her most cherished moments in life. That was until my jerk of an ex-boyfriend proposed to me at my sister's wedding. Needless to say, I absolutely had no idea. I rejected his proposal and ended up leaving him after a few weeks of him showing no signs of him being sorry at all. My sister was rightfully upset with the both of us because in her eyes, we had just took away her spotlight on a day she's been dreaming of for years. I felt so bad that I ended up giving her around half of what she paid for the wedding. A little much, I know. But when you have your whole family against you, you'll do anything for things to go back to normal. It took a couple of months, but our bond came back and I ended up meeting my now fiancé. Our wedding is in a couple of weeks and my sister has been making jokes about announcing her pregnancy at my wedding. At first, the jokes were funny and I thought they had no real threat to them. But after today, it was pretty clear she was not actually joking. My mom called me telling me that my sister said she was going to announce that she was pregnant during the speeches part of our wedding to get back at me for what I did during hers. I texted my sister saying that it was completely unfair to not just me but especially to my fiance and neither of us were to blame for what my ex did. She won't hear me out and I told her if she won't drop it then she won't be allowed at my wedding. I guess she's been crying to all our brothers and saying I'm a jerk for not only ruining her wedding but for not letting her get a tiny bit of revenge. I get it. It must be hard to have that happen at your wedding, but how should it be my fault? I didn't tell him to do it, and my now fiancé definitely didn't either. My dad and brothers said I was being petty and that it was only fair I let her do that considering what happened at hers. My fiancé is on my side though and thinks it's best I don't let her come or at least not come to the reception. I know it might seem a bit unfair for me to not let her get back at me but I didn't pay the $15,000 pity money just for her to try to ruin my wedding years later. We're both adults, and at this point, I think I could be being overdramatic. A pregnancy announcement and a proposal are two very different things, but I won't lie and say it wouldn't hurt my feelings if she did do that to me. Not the jerk. Tell her if she gives back the $15,000 she can. Yup, this. And let the family know that's the stipulation since they're all sticking their noses in. What your ex did wasn't your fault, and you've made amends the best way you can anyway. $15,000 is a ridiculous amount of money to pay to soothe her hurt feelings. Can you please hurt my feelings so I can get a payout too? If sister really insists to the point where you feel like you really have to give in or split the family, have someone announce her pregnancy once everyone is seated in the church but before the wedding starts and you and your bridesmaids walk down the aisle. That way she gets her little revenge announcement and then the wedding will start and all the attention will return to you and your fiancé as it should be. If she won't agree to this, do it anyway. After all, you had no control over what happened at her wedding. Why should she get to control what happens at yours? Am I the jerk for telling my fiancé that he will cook his own dinner from now on? My fiancé, 36 male, and I, 33 female, of four years, together for six. Both have a kid from a previous relationship. One is 12, the other is 16. He recently had a health scare diagnosed with pre-diabetes, his father passed from diabetic complications a few years ago. Therefore, he went vegan like a year ago. Our family has fully supported his change. We even bought another fridge to keep his food in. He now tries to inflict his lifestyle on us. It's not like we haven't tried any of his meals before. It's just not our choice. Anytime now we eat something he disagrees with, he goes into a lecture about how it's not good for your body and what it consists of and what we need to change. I'm talking about literally every time. I've tried to be understanding because he's dealing with something that took his father, but every time? Imagine you're about to eat a delicious piece of chocolate cake. I kid you not, he will go into how many calories you're about to eat and what it's going to do to your body, especially when it's dealing with something sugary. A nice juicy steak? Red meat is the devil. A piece of fried chicken? Grease is going to seep out of your pores. Our kids avoid being around him now when they're about to eat a snack of some sort. I've tried to talk to him about how he's making everyone uncomfortable in the house to eat around him, but he brushes it off and calls it a guilty meat eater complaint. He said if we were eating right, we wouldn't feel guilty about what he says. For the past couple of months, he's been, I don't know, paranoid if you want to call it that. He thinks someone is messing with his food, 
claims that it tastes funny. Accused me or one of the kids of touching the settings on it, which is possible, but I highly doubt it's happened, since neither of our kids are vegan. He and I are the only ones that go in and out of the fridge the most. The only time they even go in the fridge is if one of us asks them to hand us something out of it. A few nights ago, I cooked dinner as usual, only this time I was accused of contaminating his food with meat drippings. I was accused of trying to revert him back into a meat eater, that I was endangering his health. He demanded to know what skillets I used. I've always cooked our meals in different pots and pans just to avoid a situation of such. I have a sister that's vegan, so it's not my first rodeo. Tired of the accusations, I told him from now on he can cook his own dinner. That I'm tired of him trying to inflict his lifestyle on us. That just because he changed his eating lifestyle doesn't mean he gets to force it on us. He told me that I was being selfish, that I was unsupportive, and that I want to see him fail. I told him that's not true. But if he was going to act this way, then it's best he cook his own food, and I'm not budging on this matter. He's been sleeping on the couch since then, refusing to talk to me. Not the jerk at all, but I would be very worried about his mental health. He needs to see a psychologist and a nutritionist, not the jerk. Based on subsequent messages from others, I want to clarify that the husband needs to see someone who is a clinical, licensed dietitian who can guide him in determining what nutrition his body needs to function optimally. Though first, he probably needs a medical workup to determine if he has any underlying issues that are causing his behavioral problems, thanks to those who pointed out the correct professional needed and the need for medical evaluation. Not the jerk. By the sounds of it, he's headed towards a mental breakdown or is in a heightened state of paranoia. Accusing someone of tampering with their food isn't a common thing to say to someone. I would suggest he sees a doctor. Make sure he's getting all the nutrition he needs from his vegan food and that he's not acting this way because something in his body is not functioning properly due to his diet. Also, a psychologist seems like a good idea as well. Maybe this paranoia is caused by some underlying emotional issue he's not talking about and this is how it's coming out. All in all, it sounds like he needs the kind of help which you aren't able to provide. Coworker waited for hours after my shift so that I would give her a ride home even after I said no. I, 19 female, work at a library. I work in the kids department along with older coworkers, think 30s to 50s, as well as other teens. I've been working there since high school, which is how I know Melanie, 18 female. To put it bluntly, Melanie and I are not friends. We used to be friendly back in high school as we had a couple of the same friends and we've both been working at our job for years. I would definitely not call us friends currently though due to Melanie's attitude. She's that type of person who will ask for a favor, and if you refuse, she'll act like a complete jerk to you. Once in high school, she asked me for a ride home, but I said no, as I had a track meet or something that day and obviously couldn't take her. She huffed and stormed off, glaring at me for like a week before she came back like nothing had happened and asked me for a ride home again. It's clear too that she doesn't really see us as friends, as when we work together, she'll ignore me completely or just glare at me only talking to me if it's something involving our job or if she needs something. If she needs something from me, then suddenly we're best friends and she'll chat with me like nothing happened. So yeah, I don't really like her. To the main story. I came to work yesterday afternoon, like 2.30ish, and Melanie was there. Our shifts alternate slightly where there's like an hour where the two of us are both working before she leaves and I continue my shift. I hadn't seen her since we graduated, so we spent a few minutes catching up. She then asked me if I could take her home after her shift ended. I was obviously confused as I still had hours to go before I was done with mine and I told her such. She then implied that I could use my break time to drive her and I honestly laughed out loud because I thought she was joking. A. Our breaks are 15 minutes long. It would take 30 minutes to drive there and back from her home without traffic. Realistically, it would end up taking like 45 minutes to an hour because of how heavy traffic our area is. B. Who wants to spend their time off driving someone home? Melanie was shockingly not joking though, claiming that it would be doable and that she really needed the ride because she had to be home and her mom couldn't take her. I said no, sorry, but no way that's happening. Melanie stormed off and ignored me for the rest of her shift before she, I assumed at the time, left. I didn't think much more of the situation, a little amused at her audacity, but whatever. Eventually, my time to leave comes so I wave bye to my coworkers and head outside. That's when I see Melanie sitting outside on one of the benches. She immediately perked up after seeing me, running over while I just looked at her. You're leaving, right? Can you give me a ride? I was shocked. 
I flat out asked her if she had been waiting for practically four hours for me to leave even after I said no. She said that no, she walked to our nearby town to do some other things before she came back here. But in my opinion, that still counts as her waiting for me to drive her home. I was creeped out and honestly ticked off since it felt to me like she was trapping me and playing the you're leaving so you can take me too card. It took everything in me to not yell or even book it to my car. I calmly told her that I had plans after work. No, I could not take her home. And honestly, it was insane that she would just wait around and assume I'd take her instead of getting the message and calling someone else. She just stared at me. I think she was shocked I actually stood up to her. With that, I walked to my car and drove off. I really hope she never tries to do that to me or to any of our other coworkers, to be honest. You need to report Melanie's harassment to your head librarian. This will escalate. OP. I will if anything gets worse. She's more of an all bark, no bite kind of person, so I doubt she'll do anything else besides complaining about me. It would still be a good idea to let your boss know, just in case. She may be all bark, but that doesn't mean that she can't keep barking until it may as well turn into a bite. And if she's willing to stay several hours after you implicitly told her no, then she's all too willing to go to the same lengths to get you in trouble for this slight against her. As always, document this sort of thing, just in case it does escalate. Am I the jerk for calling my boyfriend's baby's mother after he left him with me because of an emergency? I, 26 female, have been with Marcus, 30 male, for four months. He has an 11 month old son from his former relationship. I only saw this baby twice because I don't like babies and his mother has already expressed several times that she doesn't feel comfortable with me seeing her baby because she doesn't know me and doesn't trust me. I don't judge her for that. Both times I met him, it was by chance on the street while Marcus and I were together and found the mother and grandmother on the street with a baby. Yes, it was super weird. And before you ask, we aren't considered dating, although we are currently exclusive. We're just friends with benefits who are too lazy to meet other people and we're comfortable with each other. We never sleep over at each other's house and only meet in the middle of the week, as he has guard over the baby's weekends. Saturday afternoon, Marcus showed up at my home with his son and said he needed help because there was an emergency in the family and he needed to go to the city where they live and it would be impossible to go with the baby two hours away. The mother and maternal grandparents had traveled. He didn't even allow me to answer. He just gave me the baby and the bag with everything and left. I tried calling and texting, but he just told me to suck it up for a few hours and then he would reward me because it was an emergency. I don't know how to take care of babies. I really don't feel comfortable and he knows that very well. And after several times telling him to come back because I don't want to be responsible for taking care of the baby, he just hung up his phone. I thought about calling the police, but I decided to text the baby's mother on Instagram, telling her the situation. His godmother showed up not even 10 minutes later to pick him up. At night, Marcus came home yelling that I caused a huge mess since he asked for a favor because of an emergency and I was the only one who accepted, the others couldn't, and that I caused an unnecessary problem with his custody since the mother would file a request for a review. Obviously, we're done. I would like an opinion from the outside. Some friends sided with me, others did not. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. He didn't ask for your help. He just left his kid at your place. Sounds like his kid's mother has every reason to request a review of the custody agreement. Considering the mother got someone to get the kid immediately after you told her the situation, I doubt he exhausted all of his options before dumping his baby on you. I doubt he even asked the mother. Mother has every right to call in a review. To be honest, even if you didn't mind and were willing to help him out, he shouldn't be leaving his infant with you, someone he's been casually seeing for only a few months. And the gaslighting is unreal from him. Not the jerk, you dodged a huge bullet here. Bad partner, bad father. Complying with a resignation request. Recently, our OG manager, who was fantastic, just left. One of the biggest things he did for our team was to keep the higher ups from meddling in our day to day lives. As long as we hit our targets, we could pretty much do as we please. Want to work from home four days a week? No stress. Want to go out on the road and meet clients face to face instead of meeting over Zoom or the phone? Be his guest. Feel like closing all your deals at 2 a.m. every night and not logging on until 3 p.m. the next day? Why not? Basically, do whatever, let him know, and hit the targets. It was all cool by him. You get the drift. Because of this, our team works very hard and constantly hit targets. With myself and a few others doing so well, we recently got promoted. 
Personally, I got the 2IC job to work with new manager, show him the ropes, train the new staff, etc. However, OG manager leaves as he can't take the stress from the higher-ups breathing down his neck about his management style. Even though we constantly make and exceed targets, they are unhappy as he's not doing it through their formula. About a week or so after OG manager leaves, the new manager and pretty much another sales team are hired. New manager is essentially just a yes man for the higher ups. Our super awesome workspace goes downhill. We're required to be in the office five days a week, nine to five, given a set seating plan and spend our time cold calling, not relationship building. We do this for a few weeks. The older reps who worked for OG manager aren't having the best time as not only are we now dealing with this shocking environment, Plus, we have to train new staff and the new manager on the systems, the product, meaning we really have no time to sell. Then we have a meeting. New manager starts going on about the importance of the new system as it will increase sales, which in turn will increase our commission. Now we get to the good part. The head office lady came down for this meeting. She doesn't have much day-to-day -day in the sales stuff. She's quiet until the end when she pipes up, saying how this company has room for growth, is willing to promote internally uses me and points out me and some of the older sales reps as examples. She then goes on to ask for the resignation of anyone who doesn't believe her way will work by 5 p.m. the next day. Me and the other sales reps who were there with OG manager simply comply with her request and hand our notice periods in at the end of the next day, leaving the company with a sales team that consists of a manager that doesn't know anything about the product or role and a totally fresh team of newbie starters who have no idea what they're doing who will not get anywhere near the target for a long time. How I shut down my Karen cousin's business. This happened in 2019, but it recently came up. I, 21 female, live in Canada, and I was planning a trip to my native country in 2019. My cousin, 23 at the time, asked if I could bring some items back. She explained that her father's side of the family, unknown to me, was having a wedding and that buying cultural clothes in our native country is much cheaper than buying it here in Canada. She asked for six dresses and agreed to pay me for the items plus a little extra for my troubles. I agreed, mostly on the basis that it's for family. It was a pain. I had to compromise on my own clothing, shopping, etc. in order to make space for her stuff. I made it back to Canada and to her credit, she paid me the agreed amount. Now here's the kicker. I was scrolling through Instagram a few days later and saw a post from her business page. She sells Ceres at a slight discount relative to those sold in Canadian stores. Sure enough, the next few images were the six dresses that I had hauled over from 14,000 kilometers away. She called it the wedding collection and marked everything up to the point where selling just three dresses would cover the full cost of everything I got plus the inconvenience amount she provided. I saw red. She took advantage of my kindness, and even if the wedding was real, she obviously didn't use any of this stuff and it was clear that it was premeditated. This is where I may have been the jerk. In my anger, I immediately commented on her Instagram post, telling the truth about how she had lied to me as I had brought all of this back for her and that I could prove it. Plenty of people DM'd me and I provided. Within minutes, she called me and gave me an earful about how I just did over her entire family because they were depending on this income. She's got two adult brothers, late 20s, and her parents, early 50s. In my opinion, someone can work. I told her that I would have still helped her if she was honest with me about the business, but that lying to me and adding me to her supply chain is really crappy. The conversation ended and so did our ties. Ever since then, her business has seen a considerable decrease in public interaction and some still leave comments about the crap she pulled. People have thanked me for speaking up as she had done the same to them, but they stayed quiet to preserve ties. Others have called me a jerk for destroying the business of a relative. In my opinion, the business was destroyed the moment she started slithering and it was only a matter of time before someone spoke up. I do feel bad if I genuinely did over the rest of her family, which is why I'm wondering if I should have just shut up. So Reddit, was I the jerk for speaking the truth? Edit. Wow, this is really blowing up, and I understand that there are mixed feelings about it. Don't worry, I recognize that I may have overshot my response to the situation. I'll explain my judgment to bring it up publicly, and hopefully that helps everyone make their decisions. I can definitely see why I was rash for bringing it up publicly. I do still think that, even though it was a jerk move on my part, dealing with it privately wouldn't have gone anywhere. 
If I had brought it up to her first, as from her natural character, there's a big chance she could have blocked me off of the only social media that her business is on, so I couldn't have spread the message to the poor souls buying these clothes. I feel like I got very lucky that she messed up and posted it to the page that I was following. If I had brought it up to her privately, she would have realized her mistake and been more cunning the way that she went about this in the future, like making sure she blocks the transporter from the page so they have no idea. I feel like I took this one mess up and didn't let go of the chance. Also, I think the whole she would have used it as a lesson learned thing would have only really applied if she was unknowingly doing something wrong and was willing to take criticism or learn from a situation. However, seeing that she has repeatedly lied to people and she was 23 years old at the time as well, it was clear that she was doing this with malicious intent. As in, she knew she was lying. She knew that it was wrong and still went with it. That didn't sit right with me. Edit 2. A lot of people are asking why I didn't just say no. I've detailed this a bit more in the comments, but essentially there was a massive family expectation for me to help her out because of this supposed wedding. There was a lot of pressure and guilt tripping that resulted every time I tried to argue that I needed space in my luggage. Stuff like, oh, you can't do this for family because you need to shop so much, right? If you can't even do this for your cousin, imagine what happens when your parents get old. Guess they'll end up in a senior home because you can't make space for them either. It gets brutal and this kind of stuff is deeply rooted in my culture. I know that there will be some people who don't understand this and that's fine. Just hold the assumption that I had no other choice but to agree to help her. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her cousin? Please let us know. Definitely the cousin. She should have been honest about this from the get-go, not lie and manipulate the way she did. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.